on. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. It is April 18th, 2022. It is 6.33 p.m. And we're in our study session. Um, first up is reports um, from city council. For myself, I had meetings with Northwest mayors and commissioners last week. The big um, talk was with all of the raise grants that went in. We also know we have two Northwest corridor representatives on the new um, rail board that's being put together to look at um, rail from Fort Collins to wherever it's going and hoping that it takes on the Northwest corridor um, fast tracks that we didn't get. Um, so that was good news. And um, uh, that was that was the big news, and we have some meetings coming up with BNSF and others looking at um, how we can all coexist. So, more of that going. Um, anyone else? I'll start with Mr. Baker, Councilor Baker. Do you have anything? Uh, right. Uh, we're going to have a Dr. Cog meeting coming up, and so if we want to address that now or if we want to put that decision about what voice Westminster wants to speak on Dr. Cog. Because I don't think we've really asked our representative, they've not given them any directions or instructions about what we want to say on Dr. Cog. And, okay, so let remind me to come back to that. Right. Uh, uh, no, short week last week, so I appreciate my uh, colleagues excusing me from uh, Monday's meeting. Um, I had an inclusivity board and they have some quick bullets of what they shared. Um, they talked about um, a group called Inclusive Journeys that does an inclusive guide for businesses. They equated it to uh, like an inclusive Yelp that gives like a guide online about him, how inclusive businesses are. So they were looking to talk with that group. Um, they were working on a presentation to bring back to council about safe and welcoming uh, program that they'd like to bring back to us in June. Um, they continue to look at and be concerned with food access in um, the historic Southern part of the city. They didn't have any update on that. That's one of their uh, committees that they're working on. They have been working on, um, they have a subcommittee on land acknowledgements that they're talking about. And that's something they would at some point potentially bring back to us. There was no real movement on that. And then they continued to look at their um, ambassadors program and doing outreach. And so they talked about um, potentially reaching out to the Hmong community. And so I had, and I mentioned this to you, I had told them I thought it would be wise for them to speak to you because they mentioned my connections to that community, which really I got for you. And I said, if you really want to get connections, you should probably talk to the mayor, not me. And I certainly am happy to connect them with the folks I do know, but I know that um, you have much longer standing ties with the Hmong community. And I have encouraged that if they're going to, you know, talk about um, the inclusive realm, and they've talked about the Hmong before, that that's a community that is very engaged and wants to be a part. So, and I know it's a, a bigger portion of our community. So. Yeah, just uh, a couple of things. Um, one with the um, study sessions, I know we're in here, um, but the doors are closed just during our open study sessions. And I had some community members, one, they weren't able to get in because the doors were actually locked, but it was just during a regular study session, not an exec session. So I want to make sure, I mean, it'd be nice if we could have the doors open. Um, so just, we're working on the we, ADN enhancements. That's part of our problem right now. So we have a bad, very bad echo. We have the right. If there is a sign on the door saying, please come in and apologize okay. if there was a problem before. Yeah, maybe they can <clears throat> be encouraged to knock if it's during study session, if we don't hear them. Okay. And then I don't know, I just noticed uh, while I was driving around, um, just in, you know, as I drive through the city, I've noticed a lot of benches missing at our bus stops. We used to have benches at most of our bus stops, like along Federal, and I've just noticed they haven't been replaced. 
And I um, just tonight saw people sitting around, sitting on the ground um, where I know we used to have a bench. So it would be nice to um, be able to replace those. Interesting. It's usually a private company. RTV doesn't put in benches anywhere. Right, we did. Right, so it would be contracted by the city. And if there's not enough ADA space, you can't have a bench. So there's if it impedes any kind of access for boarding or deboarding, then you can't. It impedes access. Oh, we had grants. We did those back when I got someone 112 when I was on that committee. Mm -hmm. Councillor Zadi. So on April 20th, I have my first human services board meeting. So very excited about that. That's this Wednesday. Um, and I have a special request to council. I would, so I've been thinking about this and trying to plan in my head, but I'm not sure how to go about it, but I would like to start door knocking. Face-to-face -face contacting different neighborhoods we could pick a different neighborhood. I would love it if one or more of you can join me. Um, you can collaborate on the form itself. So a response form. So just some some simple questions to ask them at the doors. How's it going? What? How can we help? Are the resources they're looking for that we can connect you to? And then we just start doing this on an ongoing basis. Um, that's just something that's been on my mind and curious if anyone here would like to join me and collaborate on this form that we can be armed with when we go to the doors. And may I need to add on? Uh, uh, I went to both uh, 72nd and Bradford, okay, where there's been a uh, camping there for three weeks, okay, and nothing seems to have been done at all. So I, I would like to know what we're doing, okay. I also went to the one gentleman, I think his name is Eglin or something like that, who talked about the people camping at 76 and Wolf near the railroad tracks. And the oddest thing, I mean, I just picked the time to go. It was around noon and uh, I walked and I parked in Wolf Run Park and I walked up and quickly found the path. And when I came upon a man lying on the ground and these three ladies with him, and I asked them, do they need 911? What's going on? And they said, no, everything is fine. And, and as I was walking back, I noticed we had six firemen tromping across the street because they had parked on the west side of the creek there. And they were crossing the creek and going to it. So uh, I don't think anything has been done about the camping at uh, 78th and Wolf the railroad tracks there. And I know both of these have been going on for at least three weeks. And I think we owe the people who live next door to these places the same kind of response time that we gave to the people at uh, Sheridan and 73rd or 4th, whatever it was. Jody, do you have those answers yes. to follow up? Yeah, I do. And I would, may I make a note on, on our work on, on homelessness? Um, um, appreciate uh, the, the input, and every time we we get information like this, it's, it's very helpful. Um, we do we are uh, interviewing now for the second navigator position. Um, in reference to the first neighborhood, the the, the big uh, concerted response at this in the Spanish Oaks um, neighborhood, um, the, our current navigator is still working with five of those individuals on housing, and so it doesn't go it does they don't go it doesn't get completely resolved. When the physical situation is resolved, that, that otherwise it can recede or restart. So, just wanted to let you know that it's kind of, it stacks each site. Um, they are working uh, on the on the second big site, which is uh, the one behind the Landgraf plumbing site. They have been uh, working with the individuals involved and and staff did do a large uh, debris cleanup there uh, within the past day or so. So that that's now progressing along the same curve as the first. Uh, big response in, in a neighborhood, but anytime we get information that does allow the navigator to get out and start working with individuals first, um, so that, so that then we can continue with the um, with the continuum um, of, of of effort and action. So we will definitely make note of your observations, counselor, and make sure that we get out there and 
um, and have a look at those. Right, well. because they're obviously taking the well the buckies from really grocery stores. You want to have a little app updates on this? Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, so the, the location at 76 and Wolf, um, that is actually an area that um, the police, uh, the, this, our homeless navigator is working on with our park staff. We are part of the component that we're looking to do is actually add a gate to help prohibit folks the ease of access but to drive into that area. So that's one of the things we're working on. There's a variety of other components of in pro process. Um, as, as it relates to 72nd and Bradburn, that area as well, um, our staff is working to, I think, not sure if it was today, I apologize, Tomas is not here, um, that they did get the cleaning crew to get out there at least to start the process. But again, it is a phased approach and working with the navigator. The navigator does have quite a few components on her plate. And so she's trying to make sure that she's working through that continuum of care and working to help get those individuals the resources and support they need and moving them along. But of course it takes time, which is part of our biggest challenge with, especially with one staff person right now as a navigator trying to navigate navigate all of those challenges and with those individuals but they are aware of it and they are working with those areas I, i'm sorry it's not as far along as we would like it to be but we are certainly working in those areas are we doing like the signs because isn't that one of the things we asked for was signs? On our list that we need yes they are working on that i don't know if they've got signs to these locations just yet okay now, do we have any kind of expected date when they will be gone no sir i do not have that is there some way we can uh, set a timeline that I, I need to go back with the staff and find out where we are in that process because I think it'd be really helpful if we could set reasonable expectations for well the neighbors absolutely one of our challenges is the num sheer number of sites that we have around the city that they're trying to work through and the volume and again right now we have one person who is the lead and we're reaching out to those individuals and that's quite challenging and building the time and the rapport and do we have any idea who these ladies around the town man was? That I don't know anything about. Just a just follow up on that, if I may, Mayor, too, because this all kind of goes into a, the integrated holistic approach that we've talked about of putting together a process. And I think um, because of the number of sites, if we don't have, and, and I think we've talked about this over and over again, but we have to have a process in, in place that's realistically acceptable and defensible in court. We have to have that before we just go start tossing people up. And I, we've had this discussion. And and I, in, and yes, would we like to? I mean, from a from a pure standpoint, would we like all these sites gone tomorrow? I say yes. But is that something that's defensible for the city? And if we don't have a process in place, so we have to put the process in place first that we talk about that contact options help trespass move and when we get to the trespass and move part we have to have the integration on that is okay if they're still there and we have to trespass them what do we do with their stuff because we have the legal obligation to store that where we can store it didn't we have a meeting back in march that set this out but we don't have the process in place we but can't just snap our fingers counselor and say we want this done tomorrow wasn't that the point of the meeting in march was to was to define that process. Absolutely, and that's what staff is working on, and that has been my understanding that they've been a couple memos that have come back to us. Excuse my shortness this evening, I apologize. That's fine. But I think we've are, we've discussed this too, is that we're, we're gonna put something that's legally defensible also. Well, then maybe a better question of mine is, when, what's the timeline for the process to be completed? I agree with that as well. We have the protocol is generally complete for internal. What we are trying to do is put in place the version that is to share with city council and to the public. But we are we are doing our final um, confirmation. We are making sure that PRNL, particularly their component, last through the division managers today. I haven't had a chance to touch base with them to find out whether we've got the final blessing, but I believe our internal process is complete. And that's actually what we've been using with these sites to date. But again, it takes time and, and one navigator with, you know, we've got 17 sites. Uh, we've got five just from the um, site that we dealt with in the Spanish Oaks area that we're still working with that take time to get them to move into temporary housing and then to try to help find them the permanent wraparound housing. So we have 17 identified separate sites. That's my understanding. Yes. Possible multiple individuals at each site. Yes. Okay. And signs are up at the Spanish Oaks site. Um, <clears throat> I'm reading some notes here. A key issue is having a housing option. And that's one of our biggest challenges is right now we have primarily one hotel 
that we can put folks in or that is willing to take folks, but they only have so many spaces mm -hmm. and they don't accept everyone. Okay, like in the Regis site, isn't active anymore? That I'm not, not aware of. You know which? No, they're getting, I think they were going to shut it down. <laughs> because, I mean, it was only half full. Yeah. It? Yeah. That was my understanding, someone that's there. We only have 10 spaces available at the hotel that's been working with us. Okay. okay. And so we'll have this formal process presented to council next week? Uh, is planning to come in your packet for the May 2nd? Council meeting as an info only staff report at that point, and then looking to report back to council with a further conversation on um, faith based options and things of that nature at the May 9th. I'm looking at Cody to make sure I've got the dates right because we were just chatting about it this morning. I believe that's correct. Thank you. I'm just curious on that because um, I know that when this came up, I don't remember if it was last week, but um, there was mention that one of these camps, I think the one that, that the mayor and I visited, that a handful of those folks weren't allowed back. So um, I was thinking about that quite a bit because one of the other concerns I suppose is, are they not allowed back due to one of the stays that we uh, helped them get? Because I would be curious, like, is there any kind of follow through with that? So if we're partnering with that hotel and there's folks that we're sending to them, do we hear back that those, those folks are no longer allowed if there's uh, interaction. I mean, that, I apologize. I don't that's that. fine. That's probably something to follow up, but if we're we're going to work on the process, I think we should understand the full cycle of the process. I just want to circle back to the question I asked, if anyone's interested in the door knocking. I'm interested. Um, I'm, I'm kind of trying to understand what you're trying to accomplish, honestly, because you started with the Human Services Board. Human Services Board has people who apply that are nonprofits. So, were you just sharing those two things separately, or was there a correlation? So two separate topics. One is the first Human Services Board meeting is on Wednesday. Second, completely different topic is I would like to start door knocking. Um, the purpose with that would be citizen engagement, just seeing council more often, hearing from the ground what's happening, um, bringing it back, and amplifying whatever their issues are, I think it's a good thing to be out in the community as often as we can, and not just staff, but us. They want they want to see us, so that's why I'm going to start doing this. I guess I need more context. I feel like for, for me, I, you know, in the four years that I've been doing this, I've been out in the community in a variety of ways, so I'm not sure that, uh, I'm not sure I, I had to think about it um, as far as like what that's what right, yeah. to accomplish. But if anyone is, is, is interested, let me know. And then collaborating too on this form, on what the response form. Yeah, um, so yes, definitely interested in that. And just one thing further would um, be kind of in, in reference to one of the um, metrics and performance measures that was identified in our strategic plan. Um, if there's a way to integrate council into some of our HOA, or neighborhood group outreaches because we have you know like town halls are one thing but i'd love for some other opportunities and maybe a little more geographically um focused to um to talk to people so whether it's door knocking or you know um interacting at hoa meetings or however we might you know the communications team might um organize those interactions i'd love to um see if we can be a part of them to the extent possible. So that's just that one. And then the other, the other um, question I had was just a follow up to the, um, the uh, interactions that we have with people experiencing homelessness. Do do we only have one option with taking them to the hotel? I mean, I, don't we have um, partnerships with Jefferson County and Adams County to? Are there other like SRO or other kinds of spaces that are available maybe outside of Westminster? Um, my understanding is that at least right now that we don't have those capacities. A lot of the shelters did shut down during COVID and have been slow to reopen. And so that's one of the challenges we're, we're confronting. That the counties are not providing services? It, I can't speak to that portion of it. I can speak to what housing options we have available in the city. So we don't know what our options are for the county. 
I don't personally yeah. have all that list. Yeah. Um, I know that our our homeless team does have that information, and, and they do try to navigate them with that group. But a lot of people homeless have an area that they want to stay in. Mm -hmm. um, we can get uh, Section Eight vouchers, but we can't find landowners necessarily willing to rent them. Sorry, because I just got yeah. an update right there. <clears throat> so that's one of the challenges we run into as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks for um, speaking of obligations of council. <laughs> Um, I've been on the Rocky Mountain Airport Roundtable just for a couple months. Um, I would like to ask my colleagues if somebody else could take that. My load is, is too much and I'm not really able to make those meetings all the time, really rarely anymore because my job job has gotten too busy and they're always during the day. Um, and so I'm concerned at some point it's going to always be falling to whoever the alternate is. And I don't know if that's a good fit for you to be able to do that. Um, so rather than starting to drop the ball on it, I thought I would um, ask my colleagues if anybody would be willing to do that. They do it once a month. I think it's usually from like 9 to 11 on Mondays. That day. Yeah, it's a, it's a rough, rough day to, to make it. Okay. Okay. We'll have everybody think about it and get a hold of David if you're interested. Back to Dr. Cog. Um, Jody, do we have staff that looks at when that agenda comes out, does staff look at it and give input to the, um, to our, uh, to our representative and alternate so they know what, how, how it affects us and especially things that are controversial. Um, I know sometimes they offer amendments or just say, nope, this vote no or whatever. Um, is that going to both the alternate alternate and the um, representative? Am I going to me? I, I will want to confirm that, Mayor. That's a really good question. We should because be making sure Because if she calls sure in that. at the last minute, uh -huh. you can't go. Our alternate wouldn't have seen anything. I think that will help some because mm -hmm. as long as they get that, then they're able to ask questions um, to staff so they know exactly where they're at and I'm making a huge assumption that staff is going on what our strategic plan is, what this council's thinking, blah, 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 blah. So it should be in congruence with where we're at. I can confirm that I am getting those emails from staff, but I don't think yeah, and, council and you should us. because, um, and, and you're welcome to go to any and all of them. Um, that's how I learned when Mayor Moss was, um, he just said, I was the alternate, and he said, well, just come along because then you'll see how it all works. And when he wasn't able to go, I knew people, so it didn't feel weird going. Well, thank you, Mayor, for that, because that was a great lead into that question as far as, you know, we have a we have our strategic plan as kind of our, our roadmap, but thinking along the idea of with Dr. Cog, if something was coming before, if we could get that as a council, and if it's a a big thing that we could take, you know, a position paper on it so that we could have direction on that on individual items. I think it's kind of broad to be able to do the whole thing mm -hmm. other than the foundation of our strategic plan. But to have that positional type papers would be, I think, helpful. Plus, it would link us all into the discussion then, too. So I'd be in favor of that. One more email, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anything else for email? the good of the order? We have reason for executive session. We do. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> the proposed executive session is to discuss strategy and progress on negotiations with aggregate industries for a license agreement on the Wattenberg Redwater property pursuant to CRS 246402-4E1 and Westminster Code 1113C7. Um, and Jody, I didn't forget you, but I know they're waiting to do this executive session to do you as soon as we get done with this. Sorry. Um, we have reason for executive session, and I'm going to go around the room, poll you, and ask if you're okay with going in executive session and that you'll keep it confidential. Councillor Baker? Yes. yes. Councillor Seymour? Yes. Councillor Emmons? Yes. Mayor McNally? Yes. Councillor or Mayor Putin? Yes. Councillor Nirmel? Yes. Councillor Izzati? Yes. Jody Andrews, yes. Barbara Obi, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, we so need all the we... people that shouldn't be here, and the ones that are need to state their name and say the same thing. Do you want that on this recording, and then we'll do it again on the executive recording? 
Um, it, since we've already begun, I think.
Yeah, like, can we mark oh, the record? Oh, got edit that. That's right. We're working on that. We need the equipment. It's not coming yet. On a container ship well, in the ocean. Supply chain messing everything up. <laughs> Dang ocean. Frustrating. Okay, it is 7:39, and study session is back in session as a regular session publicly. And we didn't finish city manager's report, so Jody. Oh, thank you. I would really uh, just want to draw attention to our uh, two presentations tonight. Uh, one is uh, the first one up is presentation of entertainment districts. And so I'll uh, ask staff shortly to come forward for that. Um, and we're looking forward to council's uh, feedback on that. Um, and um, uh, there will be some information provided and then you can have an opportunity to give us your direction. And the second one tonight is, um, is the city council strategic plan workshop to review proposed performance measures. Uh, the primary output tonight, uh, we hope, is uh, that you will give us direction on the objectives. Uh, we really want to uh, land those and move forward on those. The performance measures, probably not as far along as we'd hoped for this evening. Um, so what we would do is ask and, and welcome your input and feedback tonight, and then staff will take those with the consulting team and work those into a final for you. So if you see that uh, that they did a bit of work from your perspective, please give us that input tonight. We will take that and uh, re retool those and bring it back in a, a more completed fashion for you uh, next session. Thank you. No questions? All right. First up is presentation of containment districts, common consumption areas within the city of Westminster. All I can say from all of the people when I go visit the orchard, which I was there today, they say it's about time. <laughs> Very good. Are you, Lindsay? Uh, we are. Okay, great. Uh, so we have uh, two staff uh, presenting tonight, Mayor uh, and Lindsay Kimball, our uh, Economic Development Director, and Ron Arguello of our City Attorney's Office. Great. Thank you. All right. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Councilors. I'm Lindsay Kimball, your uh, Economic Development Director. We're here tonight to share with you information about entertainment districts and their corresponding common consumption areas and how they're a benefit to not only the residents, but our businesses in our community. Um, before I get started, I just want to thank, um, there's many, many departments who have worked on this with us that have been integral. There's been private sector partners. We have representatives from the orchard here tonight with us. So <laughs> <they're going. laughs> back there I know they're excited. very excited. <laughs> um, but I also want to make sure that I thank and don't forget anybody. So if, if you if you would um, indulge me, but I'd like to thank um, staff of economic development department, the city attorney's office, the city clerk's office, fire, police, community development, HR, parks and rec, Innovation Communications, and as I said, our, our private sector partners who were just really very important to this effort. So I just want to thank them. All right, so we want to start tonight by discussing what an entertainment district is and how it's related to those common consumption areas that we mentioned. Um, then I'm going to turn it over to Ron Arguello with the city attorney's office, who's going to walk you through the city's processes, procedures uh, for creation of the district, how are the events approved? How do we monitor those events? And um, how might you add additional entertainment districts in the future? Um, then we'll come back to me and we're gonna discuss how these areas are beneficial to the city, beneficial to local business owners and how they're gonna contribute to building a sense of community. Um, finally, we're gonna show you the locations of the first two districts um, that we're proposing for the city of Westminster and discuss the process for creation of additional districts in the future. Next slide, please. All right, so what is an entertainment district? <laughs> well, um, it's a creature created by the state legislature in 2011. Their purpose is to be a community gathering place for cultural events, concerts, um, activities, food festivals, both big and small. 
Um, the entertainment districts have certain um, parameters, so they can't be larger than 100 acres. You must contain at least two 20,000 square foot premises that are already licensed to serve alcohol. So you have to have existing businesses within the district. Um, and within the entertainment districts themselves is where you can designate common consumption areas. So the two concepts work together. You have a larger entertainment district, and then you can have a common consumption area uh, within that district. It doesn't have to be coterminous with the entertainment district, but it must be within the <coughs> entertainment district. Um, and these are areas, of course, where patrons over the age of 21 can enjoy uh, alcoholic beverages in a common secured area uh, that are serviced by those existing establishments with liquor licenses in, within the districts. Um, each entertainment district also has a promotional association. That's a very important concept to this discussion. Um, it will have a board of directors, bylaws. It's its own entity that will be created by the business owners in that district. And that's another way that the businesses have a say in what happens in these districts and uh, what sorts of events and how they're promoted and so forth. Um, so this clearly demonstrates there must be business support for the district. It also allows a vehicle for those businesses to work together, sometimes for the first time, to talk about what are some common goals, what kind of events do you want to see, how can we best activate this common space so that we are um, raising awareness of our location and also of our businesses. So primarily retailers, restaurateurs, uh, hotels can be part of entertainment districts. So it's beneficial for all of the parties involved. Uh, the promotional association also acts as the applicant to the city for event permits and the common consumption area permits for those events. So that's also why that entity is very important that it be established. Um, and just wanted to let you know you're in good company. <laughs> and there's many uh, cities within Colorado who have already taken advantage of this vehicle uh, mechanism to um, create these entertainment districts and the overlaying common consumption areas to help their local restaurateurs and retailers uh, improve business. And that's just a sampling of some of those uh, communities throughout the state. And I also, just one more thing I wanted to add on the slide, but that while crafting this, um, staff was very intentional and the various departments who helped us with this reached out to those communities to get best practices, to learn from maybe some of the mistakes where they stubbed their toe, what went wrong. Um, so just trying to learn from all of that and take that into account as we craft everything from the application to understanding the best way for those promotional associations to work and who should be on it and um, sort of understanding that and then also how that interplays with the existing uh, permitting regulation within a municipality. So that um, in addition were some lessons that we learned from talking to our neighbors. So that was very educational. And overwhelmingly, I just wanna share that uh, they were very positive about the experience and um, you know they did share some of the pitfalls <laughs> sure nothing's perfect um, so we've taken those into account as well and now I want to turn it over to Rob thank you council uh, good evening I think everyone I know everyone here I know Ron Arquay with Dave's office here um, so we'll go to the next slide I kind of want to give you the technical aspect mm -hmm. of where we are how this is created what happened so as uh, Lindsay had explained that this is a creature of state statutes under the state liquor licensing code that gives local jurisdictions the opportunity or the ability to create what's called an entertainment district. Now, we're not talking about mini Vegas here. You're not just going to walk around and carry. These are specific areas. And oftentimes what you think about them is we have special event permits that people come in and apply for, Harvest Fest, um, events that we have, concerts, uh, series. And they have a certain area that they barricade off and they do this and it's a one-time one-off event what, the, what we're proposing is an entertainment district gives you an area where people can come in and apply to maybe do these frequently so that they don't have to come in and apply for a special event permit every single time and we have a limit on how many special events you can do per year anyway on that um, so this is areas that we think might be beneficial where a lot of licensees might come in and work together and want these type of special events on a regular basis. So we start off with the, um, we're proposing in chapter 23 in title five to create an entertainment district. The state requires that the local jurisdiction create an entertainment district with a boundary of no greater than a hundred acres 
um, and it must contain at least two licensed liquor license premises with a total aggregate of 20,000 licensed uh, premise square feet. Um, if you meet those conditions, you can create it and you can create as many as you want. And so it's up to the this council to decide, do we want to create an entertainment district, which says people can come in and apply to create these common consumption areas, create these ongoing special event areas. By creating this entertainment district, you're not making any obligations on anyone to, to make a common consumption area. No one has to pay any fees. No one has any extra taxes. There's no financial or um, rights or um, any kind of requirements on anyone to do anything. You can create it and it can just be on paper forever and ever. Um, but it does open up that ability and the option for people to come forward and these businesses and licensed premises to come forward to take advantage of what the entertainment district does. And that's where we get into the next step after it's created is then a promotional association has to be created. That is not an obligation on the city. It's not something that the city is required to do, nor does the city really get involved other than uh, what we have proposed in the uh, code and the ordinance would be to have a city member that is a board director on one of these promotional associations. What it is, it's a separate entity, typically a nonprofit organization that's created as an entity of the state or under the state, um, <clears throat> under state regulations, not a part of the state. Um, and they create a board of directors, they create, they, and they uh, attain their own uh, insurance for the licensing, for the all the licenses, for any kind of uh, property damage, civil liability. They have their own insurance separate from what a separate licensee would have. They have dues if they decide to have dues um, because this insurance is probably going to have to be split somehow. Um, they have certain rules, regulation, their own bylaws. They're separate. They create that. And once they create that, then they come forward with their bylaws, with their lease, if they need to have a lease for the areas they want to have or their ownership or permission or licenses to use this area. And they come forward and then that promotional association can create an application with the city. And the city clerk's office has created an application. They're still fine tuning it, but they're, they're creating an application just like you would have with a special event permit or with any liquor license application. And what they're doing is they're creating this, they're showing that they have all the uh, checks that they need to have. They're uh, showing that they're gonna meet with PD, they're gonna meet with public works, they're gonna meet with CD, they're gonna meet with fire, with building inspectors and everything, everyone that they might need to make sure that this is a safe way to handle this, that the city is on board with the way that they're gonna create this. It's not just encompassing everything. And as you'll see from the map, some of this entertainment district covers to be con contiguous, it covers Harlan Street. And we know that we're not going to want to just shut down Harlan Street and we're not going to do that. So they're working with everyone to make sure here are your limitations that the city is going to put on you. And they apply and then that goes to the special permit and license board. So the, what they do is they apply one to be recognized as a certified promotional association and typically in conjunction, but they don't have to, they apply for a common consumption area that says, okay, Here's the organization. We have all of our checks in, in place. We've done everything and we want to create this common consumption area. This is what we're really talking about that's similar to the special event permit. Common consumption area has to be within that entertainment district boundary. I mean, it has to, it can only include licensed premises within that entertainment district boundary, but that premises doesn't have to be right next to where the common consumption area, they can create a stand. Um, somewhere where they're serving out of kegs or um, a mobile bar that they set up and they can still be a part of that. Um, but they say, here's where we want to have this common consumption area. Let's say it's on the plaza, the central plaza in downtown Denver, or sorry, downtown Westminster, excuse me. And um, that's where they want to rope off. They want to make physical barriers. Well, the police department um, is going to be involved with looking at what physical barriers they have. They're going to have a safety plan. They're going to have their security, just like they would with any special event permit but it's gonna be an ongoing. Every time we do a common consumption area that we're applying for, it's gonna follow these specific rules we are laying out that says, here's what our physical barriers are, here's what our security is, here are our planned event dates that we're gonna have, and they're gonna give that all to the SPLB. Um, the time that this is gonna be, so if common consumption, they could say, we're gonna limit this, it's only gonna be from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. And that's what they're gonna have as a limitation, or they might say, we wanna have it any time <clears throat> we want but SPLB will ultimately determine those kind of things. 
Two questions. One with the entertainment district um, in the ordinance, aren't we allowed to state like how often and time? Yeah. Or, so we we could do that, and then the common consumption group would kind of refine it to be within that, but potentially narrower. Correct. Yeah, yeah. and I'm going to as before I get off this slide, I'm going to kind of explain what council is really responsible for. But I can go into that now because we're pretty much right. So that the next part was SPLB is going to be reviewing this. Right. Now, just real quick, real sorry. Um, just on the common consumption group, is it still 20,000 square feet of licensed premises that you set to comprise that group? No, so no, not no really. that's just what's required to create the entertainment district. So you can't, you, you have to have 20,000 of licensed premises within the district when you create the entertainment district. Yeah. The promotional association common consumption area could be two smaller places that do that. So, okay, okay, thank you. Yep. And, and, and to go on to your point with that, the special permit license board is reviewing these applications. They have the discretion under the state statute and the liquor license code is that uh, the local licensing authority has the ability um, to um, approve promotional association, approve common consumption, and set any limits on common consumption. Now, the SPLB operates under their authority under the code. And so if council wants to make sure that they are not just give them full discretion to do everything, but they want to say, we don't want anything to be done after 9 p.m. in downtown because we have residential area down there. We don't want it to be interfering. You can put that in the code that gives them the authority only to be within the limits of what council wants them to do. And so it is important that if you have specific requirements or things that you want that to limit the discretion of what the SPLB can and can't do, that's something that would go into this entertainment district code that would limit what the, what the guidelines and parameters that the SPLB has to operate under. So that's important to note that if you if you see something in the proposed code that you think needs to be more limited or give more discretion, that's something that needs to be done when we do this uh, adoption of this code, because that's your opportunity and your time to uh, tell them what they need to do. Everything else goes to the local li licensing authority. And so the only way to really oversee that would be to take it away from SPLB and do it as council. And I don't know if you really want to take on all of that responsibility. I know. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem DeMott kind of got out of that. I don't know if he wants to go back. It's a, it's a busy group. <laughs> so that's that goes into the, so you have that common consumption area. The SPLB is going to look at it. They're going to look at the needs and desires, and that's done by the same type of things that you can have for a liquor license. That can be people coming in uh, from the community uh, testifying. It can be uh, interviews or uh, petitions signed by them. It can be an actual uh, license, or sorry, uh, needs and desires study like we do for new licenses. Uh, it can be anything and everything that kind of gives the public the opportunity to present and show, uh, well, the, the promotional station would have to show that the needs and desires are there for this common consumption area and that it meets everything that the, the SPLB and the code requires to make sure that we're not serving underage, we're not serving overly intoxicated persons, that everything is identified uh, by the, um, the licensee that is selling the beer they have to have, or whatever they're selling, they have to have their name on the cups. It can't be greater than 16 ounces, um, making sure that they're following all that and putting mm -hmm. any limitations they think they need to do on that. The only people who can sell in the common consumption area are the liquor licensed organizations within the entertainment district. Correct. And then the only ones that can actually serve after that. So that those are the ones that are eligible. Only the ones that can actually serve in the common consumption area are those that are approved as part of the promotional association. So you might have a promotional association that comes forward that only has three of the eight licensees in the entertainment district, but only those three that are in the promotional association that have been approved by the SPLB can actually serve in that common consumption area. Right. The other ones can be attached later on, but it's kind of like a dual purpose. Only those ones that are in the common consumption are even eligible. And then from that, whoever is in the promotional association. Right. And each one of those organizations who serves in the common consumption area still has to meet all the, all the requirements of their liquor license, which right. addresses overindulged and underage. Correct. So you said that people could... Um, 
be attached later on. Is that something that they would have to go back to the SPLB if they wanted to add additional people after the fact? Correct. And that's part of the state state license, the liquor licensing statute. It requires that that they go back. So. And then, um, since you're on, on that note, um, I imagine that it's the same as most things, like with the state compliance that oversees all of it. So we couldn't be, like when you talk about um, hours of service, like it can't be more than what the state is. It has to be less, but we can be more restrictive, just not more, Correct. less restrictive. Yep. 7 a.m. to 2 or 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. are the serving times. I think we've put in. We've I figured I just didn't want anybody to get crazy and think that we can go crazy. Yeah. And so if you guys want to limit that, then you can limit that even further. You can always go more restrictive. You just can't start expanding what the state said that we can do for that. They're still the boss, everybody. <laughs> so um, next, if you go to the next slide. We talk still about one next slide. I think that's still the same one. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the public safety aspect. And so that's when the SPLB is looking at, they're looking at the public safety. And one thing that I, I've done a training with SPLB on this already, we'll continue to do trainings, but they're really going to be looking at, this isn't a one-time event that you're looking at it. You're going to have to consider this could happen every day if they if they approve that or it could happen every week or, or something of that sort. And so you want to make sure that you're really crossing uh, all your T's and dotting all your I's. So they're going to be looking in the city in the application process, looking at what is the emergency access? Are any roads being shut down and how is fire or police going to be able to access those roads in case of an emergency? Are there street closures allowed? And um, I think if you want to restrict street closures, that's something we put into the code that will never shut down Harlan Street, will never shut down Eaton Street, those kind of things. Um, what security officers are going to be assigned? How many security officers are you going to need per however many people you expect to have there? Are they going to be police officers, off-duty police officers that you're hiring, or is it going to be a separate security um, organization that would be licensed through the city by their requirements? Um, what kind of barriers? Are they going to be physical barriers? Are they going to be uh, caution tape that's put up there? Um, that can be something that if you want specific physical barriers, you can mandate that in the code as well. And the SPLB would decide what was an appropriate physical barrier. And who pays for the officers or security? That's, it's all on the promotional association. City has no costs for this. There's nothing other than potentially having a, on the promotional association and the code that we uh, propose is that there will be a city representative that is required to be on the board of directors for every promotional association. That way the city has say in it, and if anything does happen in a vote or anything that might be detrimental to the city, that representative has a vote and can bring it back to the city to say, hey, where are we at on this? Um, so that would be a job duty that they would have. So it would probably be their time would be the only expenditure that we would have for that. And if we're short of officers at the time they ask, it's okay for our chief to say we don't have officers to give? for that event? Yeah, I mean, we're not mandated to have any of our officers do it. They would have to find the alternative. And so that might be a good aspect for SPLB to, to ask questions on to say, if the plan is we're gonna hire off-duty officers, what happens when there's not enough to be able to serve that time or they're all over their hours or, or something of that sort? That'd be a great question for the SPLB to ask them to say, what's the next step or what's your backup plan? How are you going to be doing that and who are you going to be hiring and how are you going to handle that on a last minute uh, time frame where you don't have that? In terms of um, compliance checks, so I know with the businesses that are there, you you know, when you're going to do compliance, they get the letter that goes out and says, hey, we're going to be out doing compliance checks. How would that work with a special district? Would it still be kind of I mean, because it depends on what the events are. So is, would they still get some sort of notification that you're going to be out or should they just expect that at any time compliance checks can happen? Have you thought, thought through that piece of it? I see Troy, yeah, I, so I'm sure he has. I would defer to Troy on that one. Hi, Council. Troy Gordon here. I'm a liquor enforcement officer for the PD. <clears throat> we do send out letters. We wouldn't have to necessarily send one out to the specific association because we already send them out to every licensed liquor establishment. So they would already be on notice. 
um, but if direction is to send it also to the to the board, different boards for the associations, then we certainly can do that. Yeah, I think to me that it seems like it's it meets needs. I guess that it might just be um, a good reminder to the licensees who participate in this that you know they get that that warning, so it doesn't necessarily correlate the same way it does when you are going to do the compliance checks. I guess because you kind of have a a little bit more of a heads up kind of with those I, I always felt like anyway but you know what I mean like it's but I guess it's just one of those things that they they're at least aware that that's something that we do and I guess they probably I mean already are since they're licensee but I, I think that they would definitely be aware that that's the case I don't know about the giving them a time frame in the next month we will be going out and checking yeah. but I, I think in the application that it, it's made clear that they're both state and Westminster can do compliance checks and remind me the state just kind of they just they're not as as kind as the city they just kind of show up when they show up yeah so um so we go on last part is that um that's what you talked about there's frequent inspection by the state and the city and like i said so part of the part of the requirements under the state licensing code is that they can be no bigger than 16 ounces that they have to have the logo and name of the um, licensee on the cups that are there. So you can tell if there is a violation, at least where that liquor or beer or wine or whatever it is came from at that point. <clears throat> so and that's a other question is, so then if that's who served and it's their cup, they serve. So then if there was a compliance failure, that would go back to the that individual holder, not the whole group. It would likely go to both. Um, is what you're typically doing because they're they're they are still under the same obligations under their own license under the common consumption area but the promotional association in the common consumption area is something that has to be renewed on an annual basis too so we're looking at violations of the promotional association as well um, and so that might be something where they decide that hey we're going to remove this violator from our promotional association so in order to make sure that the SPLB is comfortable or city clerk if they get long to actually renew our license on that or we're going to hit them with a penalty or they get hit with the penalty but i don't think that the city would ever double whammy them saying hey the promotional association and the licensee are being in trouble i think more so the promotional association is looking at are you going to be renewed are you going to keep operating whereas the licensee might have to serve a specific suspended days or serve days for the specific violation question mm -hmm. um in the ordinance um do well just citywide are we still doing at zero events or at least city run like harvest fest I, okay back in the day we were doing that zero waste events um so that's a great question counselor we haven't had an event in so long yeah, because of covid right. yeah. um so we will revisit that i know right yeah <laughs> this year I, yeah it's like a I left and then COVID happened. So it's like everything's frozen in time. So I guess just one one question I'd love to, or something I'd love to see in the ordinance is that we ask that um, these events, because I'm assuming they can create a lot of trash, um, that we would ask that they be net zero events like a city. I wouldn't want to do that. Do you like trash instead? Yeah, I love trash. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, we do it at the city, so I'd love to ask other people to do it as well. Any other questions on the public safety aspect? <clears throat> All right, so next slide. And so uh, we get into our city involvement. How is the city involved in this to make sure we have some oversight? Uh, we start off with the application review, um, and that's where the city clerk's office has created this robust application. You have to go through all the department inputs, fire, police, CD, city clerk, PRNL. Um, if I, I don't think PRNL would be as involved in, say, the orchard because we don't have any parts of our parks there, but definitely in the downtown area. But they're going through all the proper departments to make sure everything is looked at on what they're planning on doing. And does it comply with the code? Does it comply with our safety measures? Does it comply with what we want as a city as well? And then after it goes through all those checks, that's 
time where once it's complete, then it can get scheduled for a hearing with the SPLB. Um, like I said, there's a there's a city representative that's required to be on the board of directors. Um, so there is a vote and there's also always communication back to the city on what's going on, what's planned, what changes might be coming. Um, and then you have the SPLB approval. One thing that we have changed compared to licensing in this code section is that typically you have, once the SPLB approves the liquor license, then it is administratively renewed by the city clerk's office each year. So the city clerk gets a renewal, they say, okay, unless something has come up that Lisa's seen or you've gotten a lot of complaints, um, they can go through a, an expedited uh, administrative review without the SPLB rehearing what's been going on. Um, we have changed that since this is such a new concept, so, so many events can happen at one time with multiple people that, um, or multiple licensees that we've said, for the first two renewals, we are having SPLB have another public hearing to hear these because there's probably gonna be two, maybe three common consumption areas between downtown and Orchard, um, that the SPLB will hear those renewals, will get updates from the city representative, from, any, from the police department on how many complaints maybe we've had about you know, being too loud at too late a time or disruptions that have happened because of people coming from the common consumption area, any violations that we've had, what, they, what the uh, promotional association expects to do in the future. Maybe they see, wow, we could really expand this to every single weeknight we can do this. And maybe that's something that they wanna look at with that renewal. And so the, for the first two renewals, the SPLB will be looking at that and determining whether or not there are more restrictions they want to place based on what has been presented by the city representative, police, and whatnot. Um, or are we just going to renew it for another year? They get another update of calendar of what's going to be expected. And if it's been two renewals and we don't feel that there's a need because it's operating seamlessly, things seem to be going well, there's not many complaints, then we allow it to be transferred to an administrative review where the city clerk does that. It's very similar to our special event permits where you can come in and if you hold the same special event, you still have to come back to the SPLB for three times. After three times, then the city clerk can renew it um, if it's done in the same, uh, substantively the same location, same type of event. Um, so we followed that process where we do a special events and applied it to the common consumption <laughs> areas as well. So there's a bit more oversight from the city uh, to make sure that it's operating smoothly for several years before we actually kind of say, okay, let's just administratively do it. And then of course, anytime there is uh, abundance of complaints or issues that come up, uh, the city court can always refer it right back to SPLB to look at it. So it's not saying after three years, you're automatically renewed. It just makes it a simpler process, but you can always be put forth back to SPLB before um, any kind of um, renewal happens. And of course, city council is always welcome to come at the public meeting uh, to come and give any uh, input or statements that you have heard for the SPLB to consider at that time too. Um, or have the city representative give that kind of information as well. Um, any questions on our involvement? <clears throat> um, I'm actually, you had mentioned like the city, and so I know the city does a lot of special events where they pull permits. And so just thinking through what uh, the district means for people who do special permits, I imagine this doesn't keep people from doing a special event within those bounds. So they could do do the same. That doesn't change anything other than the people who actually apply to be part of the association. Yeah. Um, the, the, the only thing I could see as a conflict would be if the common consumption area say uses our, our central plaza area in the downtown Westminster, they already have been approved for the common consumption area. They already had an event planned for a certain date and a special event permit comes in and asks for that same date for, for that. I think that's where the SPLB would have to consider whether or not something was already planned, which part of the application is to write down all of your dates that you plan to have something. Um, and, and if it's already on that <laughs> plan date, they could probably look at that and be notified right away by city staff that there's already a planned event on that date. Um, that's the only way I can see a conflict, but it doesn't keep them from saying, I want to have it in this area and the city's okay with having it in that area. It doesn't conflict with the common consumption area. We can still have it in that area and just because it's the common consumption. The landowner gets to decide how they're going to use that. And if the city's the landowner, they get to decide when and how to use that outside of what's already been approved. Okay. 
Thank you. Anything else? Councilor Nimmel? Do they have to, when the common consumption area is during an event, do they sign it differently or like, you know, would it, so somebody has this one-off special event, you know, where we typically would have, you know, the common consumption area events and would there be any confusion if something goes awry with that special event? And then, I don't know, I guess it might just be the hazard of having multiple parties run events. That yeah, and I, I would think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if there were complaints about an event, we could easily see, you know, who who did it, who was responsible for it, who got the permit, and then we would be able to identify, was that the common consumption area, the promotional association, or was it um, something else not related to that, and then hold them accountable? It, it's not in the code to require special signage. If that's something that you want to have in there or added, that's something that you would need to consider with this, but I think it would be easily distinguishable as the police would our the police would already know and city clerk would already know what are the dates that they have listed in their application. And also an application comes in for a special event, you know the date and location for that. And then you would also have the distinction that I doubt that any special event is going to have 16 ounce cups with the name and <laughs> label of the place printed on it. So you might be able to easily tell between that as well. So I think there's enough safeguards to say we would at least know on a violation. Now the public, I don't know if they would know or be able to distinguish the two other than maybe there's some signage for special event on those that happen. Okay. All right. That's a very cool question to stem off that is if someone violates it, what are the repercussions? Someone violates the like the <clears throat> liquor laws? Yeah. Like if something goes awry, something happens. So what so both the licensee and the promotional association can be held re held responsible for that. Um, the licensee, the promotional association, we likely wouldn't have any kind of you're suspended for six days from holding common consumption areas, but they would be something that would be logged in to say, you know, if it's a serious enough thing, it might come before the, uh, the SPLB to determine whether or not this, the promotional association, the common consumption area um, is revoked at that time if it's serious enough. But we probably, if we don't have serious, but it's maybe serving an underage, which is still serious, but not something you'd likely revoke the whole promotional association, that might be something that's logged in um, and looked at on a renewal that happens. And then the licensee that is found in violation can be um, looked at with the SPLB. They can go for a hearing on the particular violation because they still have to follow all those same things. So their license, that particular licensee might be suspended or given a warning or whatever, wherever they're at in the, the process of how many violations they've had in the past, um, they'd be looked at as if it happened on the premises as well. And the city would be insured, right? That's part of the requirement. <clears throat> part of the requirement is minimum in so minimum insurance requirements um, that are listed on there. Um, I think it's our standard 1 million, 2 million aggregate um, and that they have to show proof of that and they have to provide that. And I think that I, I have to double check, but I think usually we have that the city's added as an additional insured in that requirement in that policy. And I'm pretty positive that we'll put that on there. And that protect the us from the, the liability, if any. Yep. Anything else? And I would also thank risk as another department that assisted in the development of this. I think we had some consultation with risk regarding the insurance questions. All right, next slide. All right, and back to me. I uh, just wanted to show you some examples of how we've activated uh, public spaces. You have the Orchard Concert Series there, uh, great gathering. Also, the Latino Festival in uh, the Westminster Station area, uh, great gathering. And um, just wanted to give some more visual examples of, of what we're thinking about when we say an entertainment district. So. We want these to be places that naturally pull our residents and help build that sense of community. And also, you know, it's a mechanism for business owners, as I said, to work together. It's um, it, it's it's fun. It's hometown events, and it also can be once a year larger scale events. 
put on by these promotional associations within the entertainment district. So it's it's all what goes back to building community. It's driving business <clears throat> to our, our restaurants and retailers as well. Um, and I just wanted to tell you quick some, some examples of, of what that might look like. So it could be examples like the pictures that you see here, but it also could be um, things that are reoccurring so that folks who are visiting these areas, I'll, I'll use the orchard as an example, you see that a concert series. So it implies uh, repetition and unknown schedule. So what I think of are like um, many places have a first Friday art festival or uh, the Saturday, you know, it's going to be barks and brews in the park. So bring your dog, uh, have a have a beer uh, sort of thing. And it's 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 a known uh, event or the farmer's market. Oh, I know that's every second Saturday at this location. So those are also the things that we're trying to build with this as well. And the frequency and repetition and activation of these common spaces so that people know, hey, you know what, I know there's always something going on at the orchard or there's, there's something always going on in downtown Westminster. And oh, it's Friday. I know that's when they do the art block or that's when it sparks and brews in the park or something like that. So um, we're also trying to build that frequency. And those are those more hometown, hey, oh, it's uh, after work, do you want to meet at this event going on at the orchard? Um, and so that, of course, again, drives business for those retailers who are selling beverages in the common consumption area, but also it brings a lot of foot traffic to the retailers in that area. And a residual benefit is that um, familiarity that it breeds with the different areas. Oh, hey, I know, I know where to park or I know how to get around the orchard. I know how to get around um, such and such a place. Um, I was there last weekend and I was at the great event they did. So it, it also draws people back so it, it adds additional sales later on down the road and breeds familiarity. Um, so that's another benefit of these entertainment districts that we actually heard that from some of the communities that we spoke with. Uh, that was the, those residual benefits of having uh, greater exposure and awareness of the different areas and different shops in those areas. So it's not just about the folks selling the beer or the wine or, or what have you, but it's also they walk by and go, hey, wow, I like that that's a neat shirt or I like this, I got to check out that bookstore when I when I come back next weekend. It, it's those sort of interactions as well. So we're trying to build um, in the end, no pun intended, but a buzz for the area. So you can uh, <laughs> uh, have a benefit for all of the merchants there and the community. Um, again, these aren't large, large scale things. These are really, we see them as community building, um, business building activities that are beneficial. Next slide, please. Okay, so the strategic plan connections. Um, we saw this really as we want our residents not just to enjoy the city and how beautiful it is, but we want them to fall in love with the city. Um, so we, we want them to have that same sense of ownership and belonging and community. And you've mentioned that in your new vision uh, for the city and mission and those strategic objectives of a shared sense of community, high quality of life, strong sense of community belonging, um, incredible, safe, well-maintained, vibrant destinations in Westminster. So we see this as uh, contributing to those goals. And, um, you know, we, we feel that, um, you know, the more that people can, can have that sense of ownership and belonging uh, the more engagement that they'll have actually in, in other areas. So there's all of these external benefits to having people feel comfortable in their community and knowing there's lots of fun things and being proud of your community. So it's sense of pride, sense of community, um, all leading to greater engagement, um, caring, and uh, in the end, a higher quality of life is what we're, we're trying to work for there. Next slide, please. So we wanted to show you the maps of the two proposed entertainment districts. And again, our, our limiting factor is, um, you know, size. So we, we've maxed out up to, we're at about 99.99 acres on, on both of these sites. So uh, we wanted to maximize who was included there. And you, I just want to point out in the downtown Westminster piece that we did cross over and we picked up um, those shops that have Coca-Pelli and some of the other businesses and, um, 
purveyors um, of beverages who are who are in that location. So they actively wanted to be included, um, and and obviously we listened and have included them in this initial boundary for downtown Westminster. So we thought that was really important to include them. Um, and the orchard, as you can see, um, those were in consultation with them, the boundaries they thought would be most beneficial and activating as much of that common space and um, folks that already, as we mentioned, you have those liquor licenses who are able to serve alcohol that are within those boundaries. Um, and, and I also just wanna mention, I know we were specifically in the proposed ordinance going to identify and create these two initial entertainment districts but the, the, it also allows you the general language so that, um, as Rob's mentioned, folks can come back from other areas, you know, maybe the promenade, maybe um, some other area of, of Westminster that would like to say, hey, yeah, we'd love an entertainment district in our area. And so the door would then be open and then there's a, a stated process so they can enter into the process and um, be able to create another entertainment district. So. In the future, if, if there was a groundswell um, from the business community in a certain area, hey, we want one too, um, there is a process outlined in the proposed ordinance. So you would be able to do that and um, city council would be able to vet that. Okay, and next slide, please. So next step, so um, we, we are here today, of course, to get your feedback. Um, but if, if it was uh, positive and you would like us to continue to move forward some of the dates there so we could have the first reading of this ordinance on May 9th to create chapter 23 in the Westminster Municipal Code. Um, also, uh, we would um, allow for as in the future, as I said, additional entertainment districts that can be added as a result of the language within that chapter um, as necessary and as approved by this body. So with that, I think we're here to answer any questions. I was wondering, would you create, um, to the point of um, having additional opportunity for entertainment districts over time, would you create like a website or some type of inform, you know, informational landing page where people could sure. know who to contact, how yes. to do it? Yes. I imagine it would have to be staff initiated to bring it to council. Uh, it would, but I, I would think, um, you know, that, that it would be from that push from the private sector that would approach staff and then staff would right. present that to you. But then that's why it's like, who do I contact? And, yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and many of the cities that we've looked at, um, you know, we perused their websites and they, they had just great, straightforward, here's what this is, here's how you apply. These are the links to the different, you know, state statutes and here's our code as a city. Um, so I thought, yeah, there, there are some very good templates that we could emulate. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Councilor Baker. So the advantage of this is this empowers these local people in this area to do things and streamlines the process, which they can do now, but they'd have to go to the S to like the special license board each time. And this basically puts more authority into their hands and less paperwork to go through and mm -hmm. things like that. And there's no loss in holding them, them accountable for their conduct and errors. Correct. Yes, sir. And special events, I think, are limited to six per year per applicant. So um, if they did a special event they, uh, in Orchard, they could only do six of them. Right. And so, so this is why they could do one every weekend in like the summer months, and I would allow that. Yes. Okay. Uh, is there any downside? I, I would say the downside that I could see would only be uh, people that don't want to have that in that area. So, I mean, so there might be people that don't want to have that much, many people coming and having events in downtown Westminster that might live in the apartments, mm -hmm. but that'd be the same if you had multiple special events that are going on too. Right, and you could have multiple special events sponsored by different people yep. to get around the six yep. limit so, anyway. So there's really not a lot of downside for the city, uh, for the licensees, because it doesn't require them to do anything. 
we can create an entertainment right. district and nothing could ever happen. Right, and you're not forcing anyone yeah. to pay dues and stuff like yep. that. It's a voluntary responsibility they take on. Yep. And if there's something bad about it, we'll know when people complain. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Don't show up because they, they don't like it in their neighborhood. There you go. Um, They'll tell us. Mayor <laughs> So I just wanted to share some comments. I don't have any more questions, but I'm looking at an email from November 10th of 2018, which is the first time I started bugging the city manager's office about the special entertainment district because Adrian Gutierrez, who runs the Three Margaritas, reached out to me after he had been hounding former city manager Tripp and uh, former counselor Shannon Bird about it. So, and I know I've hounded city attorney's office about this too so i'm very pleased to see this come forward because i know um, there's need for it you mentioned the two different events i know specifically three margaritas does a cultural uh, dance event that this would come into play as well as the, the concerts which i know Councilor seymour likes um, in the orchard so <laughs> i'm very pleased to see this come forward and i think it's going to be a, a great benefit to those areas well Councillor Baker took my question <laughs> is the, what are the downfalls, but I'm going to take it a step further and just uh, say in your research, it seems it seems good um, and it but it seems like not very many cities are doing this um, entertainment district. So I'm just wondering in your research, have you found any reasons why other than maybe geographically it's not set up appropriately for them? I'm just like Arvada to me seems like it like Old Town Arvada seems like a good place to have that kind of thing. Like, how come more cities? We've had COVID for two years. Well, it's, it would have been <laughs> in place for 2011 though. So that's what I'm. Sure. I'm sure it's sure. a handful of cities. Sure. So yes, Councillor, that's a great question. Um, and that listing was was not uh, comprehensive. So I, I believe the number is about 21 or so. It's in the 20s of cities, municipalities throughout the state who have utilized the program. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so sorry. It wasn't just, that was just a sampling of to show size and variety and geographic distribution. And also, um, for example, Pueblo, you know, wasn't on that list, but that was one that has a very comprehensive program. And um, gosh, I think within Pueblo, there were, 14 different um, initial entertainment districts recognized. So it's also, I think, the scale of the communities. Um, and it may be, um, you know, maybe that that would have something to do with it as well. But then, you know, there's plenty of communities that aren't, you know, I don't think anybody would say they're large communities, but uh, particularly, uh, you know, in the mountains and, and some of the more touristy areas, uh, they have wonderful programs and they, they were some of the first to set up this because they rely so heavily on tourism and, and activation. So um, yeah, that, but, but um, we, but I think you also asked the question, um, you know, did we talk to anyone who hasn't done it or did, we, we did not, um, but we, we did try to research everyone who's, who's gone through that process. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councillor, we'll follow up with the full list of the, of the, jurisdictions in the state that have entertainment districts that would be helpful. Okay. Sure. That to you. No problem. Neighbors don't. They'll come to our true. That's true. <laughs> um, my question is because I got hit with this when the city of Westminster went to zero waste with their events. They made a horrible mistake of giving the um, vendors less than two weeks notice that if our products weren't in zero waste things, our stuff would we'd be shut down. Mm -hmm. Two weeks. Um, we're now in a supply chain issue. I can guarantee you, I've been to two restaurants in the last two weeks that you order something and they can't give it to you in the correct size or they can't do it to go because they don't have lids or whatever the issue is. These people are on a shoestring. If they don't have zero waste, we look past it for this year until the supply chain gets better. Um, there's no reason why we should say no to somebody because it's things out of everyone's control. And having been a person that had to go through that, um, you, people need time, and, but most of all, they need to know it's out of their control right now. Um, I, I wasn't in that, and I luckily had my packaging that was okay, so I didn't get thrown out of the festival, but... 
less than two weeks notice is just not right. Now with the timeline with this, if this comes to us now, are these people going to be, are they able to form? Are they able to be working on their bylaws? Are they, be able, are they able right now to be doing a million things so that they can have this for this summer? That's my main question. Yeah, so there's, I mean, anyone can create a promotional association without an entertainment district or whatnot, because it's a separate legal entity. They can create their bylaws. They just likely wouldn't have a city representative on their board at that time, but they can have them at whatever point in time they actually go through the application. So they can have their insurance already done. All this legwork can be done ahead of time. So then it comes down to once this becomes official code um, as a part of our code, then they can go right into the application process. And so are these two entities ready to go? I believe that the orchard's pretty getting pretty close to that. <laughs> um, I think they're they're going to the final steps of figuring out the promotional association uh, requirements, who's going to be a part of that, um, having an attorney draft up that information. I don't know that we're close on the downtown. I don't know that they have thought of who's going to be the promotional association uh, because the orchard is all privately owned and best are, uh, handles the management of them now, um, used to own the land of there. They're really ready to go and have everyone all uh, lined up. I don't think that we have that cohesiveness with all the different licensees in downtown at this time. We'll go get them, Orchard. <laughs> and, and I do know a Phil and too, Mr. Agrayo, um already did the initial training for special permits and, and licensing. And so um, they're, they've gotten the first and it was a rather extensive meeting on that too with the understanding of once council approves this get ready here it comes so special permits is uh, ready to go I just want to because you brought up the zero waste thing I will I wouldn't be in favor of tying it to that I'm in favor of us encouraging that um, but I don't think we're in a place where we should be um, demanding that on anybody if you look at what happened during COVID there were a lot of those things that were thrown out the windows, such as, you know, no uh, single use plastic. I think even Denver threw that out for a time being because they needed the ability to have that. So beyond supply chain and that, you know, I, I don't think that, that this is something I want hinging on that. Um, but I always look for opportunities to educate people on that in the community. I thought I saw him. I just wanted to give my support for this. Uh, I've heard about this for a while. I didn't know much about it until this. So thank you so much. Um, I know a lot of businesses over there want this. Uh, it's going to help customer experience. It's going to help civic, not civic, but cu uh, engagement, customer, customer engagement, right? Um, and it'll, the likelihood of the events being successful, the city's backing behind it. Um, it's just a great, it's a, it's a great opportunity. So thanks for doing this. Thank you. I would just say, um, having worked on this with staff before I left, I just, you know, hopefully we can recognize all the work and, and the staff members that were a part of this on the agenda matter, because they did a lot of, like Nathan Lawrence, put a lot of work into <laughs> talking to other cities. And so I just want to recognize all the work that's been done. And yeah, so I'm excited. Thank you for bringing this. And I am sure COVID did not help. <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Councilor, for recognizing that, that the staff has worked very hard for a very long time on this. So we, we definitely um, want to recognize their efforts. And it's been such a collaborative effort as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that the city should be really proud of is, I mean, the, the vast number of departments that worked on this. I'm hearing seven people say, bring it on. Yeah. Are there any other any kind of limitations that you want in there or anything that any direction other than let's let's get a draft and see what it's like the only thing i can think of is because um when i go to nantucket to help with weddings um they do have ordinances because if you're having something on the beach it echoes everywhere and there's a certain time you shut down and that's it theirs is 10 o'clock what it needs to be for downtown you don't have it quite as much you have the people to the north of where the orchard is, but not right on top of where the A loft will be the closest because, and I know they're excited about it, but they're the closest to those apartments. The rest is a little bit further to the south, but in downtown, you've got people all over. So if you're gonna be a good neighbor, having lived next to the Westin for its lifetime, 
-hmm. and knowing they tried to do concerts and whatnot. And I couldn't even talk to my neighbor in my front yard because of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Good neighbors are good things. And it means having time limits and not blaring at the um, tops of your lungs. So I say nine to 10, but that, well, do we want it to time limits? That's what they're asking for. You direction. can put it in the code as time limits, or you can make suggestions to SPLB as far as what council would prefer um, and still leave well, it in their those discretion. Two, those two areas have, have housing, and I, I can't imagine you let it go past 11. If you want people living down there. Okay, and I'd be fine with 11. I think that's a reasonable time frame. I must go to bed a lot earlier than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I get up before the crack of dawn. So um, I, I'm, I'm especially thinking, well. What time do the stores close? Nine ish? Yeah. yeah, our concerts end at 8 p.m. Yeah. So. Yeah. See, you know, in the summertime, it's still light. It's, yeah. still, it's right. still a safety. You know, we don't want to create a bar, outdoor bar, because right. then there's associated problems with that. Um, I'm good with nine. Yeah, because in closer you get, you know, we're still in the summertime. It's just getting dark then. Maybe is there like a recommendation that could be made based on what some other towns or cities do? Sure, sure, definitely. We can investigate that. Because they, I bet, I bet, I'd say two a.m. But well, I would, but I also, don't, <laughs> I also don't want to hinge it off of what another city does because they're not, they're going to be different. I mean, with the whole point of the living quarters is the people that live in our city. Right. So right uh, on top. I, I, I think to me, 10 is fine. But if I understand what you're saying about nine, personally, 11 sounds fine too. But I think more <laughs> but people if, would be if the reasonable with 10 or 9. At 9, what else are people going to do? That is one of the intents of this. That's right. Yeah. Is to drive That's why, why do you want them there longer? Well, and she it, said at the, at the end of 8, right? So. Well, I, think, I think in the orchard that's one thing, but in the downtown, most of the restaurants might be open later. So, and that's kind of what's going on there. So, I don't know. I, that's why I'm kind of like mm. one thought, if we may, if we, if if we do something like nine, and I, I recognize it's a little bit arbitrary, but but also there's some you know thoughts as far as after dark and those things, having been in the bar business, how people's mentality changes after a while, is that we can always start a little more restrictive. And then later, you know, we, we can we can update the code and say, you know, and uh, I'm just always it's it's easier, you know, it's easier. It's easier to say no because you can always say yes, but once you say yes, it's out the door. So that that's just my thinking. I'm you know, kind of holding it and see where we go in the future. I mean, also don't need to be punitive, right? I mean, we're not gonna hopefully. I mean, we should write it very. You know, as guidance, right? We'd like it to be nine, but if it goes well, past, it, we we'll, shouldn't like ordinance. That well, it's gonna be. Ordinance take You can yeah. write it, and you can well, the like water it down. Water it down. SPLB. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think you have a valid point that to start more restrictive. So if you want to do that, I'm happy with nine because you could, you could come back and say this is is too early. And I think the the point about the the concerts is a good point because I mean. You go up there during the concerts people still then they kind of go into the restaurants and stuff that are open for a little bit longer and then it kind of clears out so it's not everybody mm -hmm. rushing out yeah. okay and i'm good with nine too i know you're not supposed to speak but can you give me head nods if you're from the orchard and it like <laughs> nine o'clock is sort of open thank you thanks for being here we appreciate <laughs> it very good okay Outstanding. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
planning objectives. All right. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. We'll jump right in. I'll introduce uh, our consultant, Shannon, and uh, you're going to lead us right in um, to, to the work at hand. I did a brief introduction earlier. Uh, ideal focus uh, tonight would be to um, get a strong direction on the objectives as they are presented. And Shannon will walk us through that. Uh, and then uh, to give us your feedback and any uh, direction you'd like to see on the performance indicators, which we'll then bring back uh, in another version. Hi, how was everyone tonight? Last time to make sure that you can see everything after our last session where we went through, you gave us some feedback, we incorporated those changes and revisions just to make sure everyone is okay with what they have in front of them. And answer any questions. I know Councillor Zadi, you weren't here for that one. So if you have questions, I know you sent some things over, we are happy to address those if you want to see as well. Yeah. And then as we go, we can talk about the performance and outcome measures that staff has developed. We've had a couple of sessions and staff has done a really great job of trying to find some measures that are really going to be supportive of your broader goals and objectives and those priorities and figuring out how to make sure that they're measurable. And if there's not an existing measure or outcome, figuring out what kind of data they can start collecting to establish a benchmark so that moving forward, you'll have that kind of information. So that was kind of the process that we've gone through for those performance measures and outcomes to give you a little bit of a glimpse into our thinking with those. Any questions right off the bat before we get going? Let's go through. All right. So we've got under preparedness and resilience, focused staff objective number one, ensure adherence to the National Incident Management System and Incident Command System, and the related performance, <clears throat> excuse me, an outcome measure is that a particular percentage of city staff and city council are trained on these two by a certain date. And we're still looking to finalize the exact percentage if we want it to be 100% or what percent makes the most sense. And that will dictate that date. We want to make sure that it's something that's driving and pushing and stretching a little bit, but not something that's not going to be achievable. Any questions on that one? Keep going. All right. Work collaboratively with city staff, business owners, and residents on resiliency and mitigation planning. And for this performance and outcome measure, we've tied it to that national community survey that the city does. They send it out every two years. They're sending it out again this year. So you'll have another one in 2024. That'll give you some pretty rich metrics around what respondents in the community think about things like these. So I've tagged it to the question that will be going out in 2022, efforts to ensure your community is prepared for emergencies and disasters. And then you'll see in my comments off to the side, I've put in the <clears throat> closest comparable uh, community survey response for 2020, the last time it was done. And the average rating, which was 68, goes from 1 to 100. And then where you fell nationally, as well as locally, for other communities that take that same survey and had a similar question. My question here was, with it saying mitigate risk to our natural, especially that natural, mm -hmm. um, our open spaces, to me, is right there. So we have to work collaboratively with ourselves and our businesses because we own the open spaces. That's a good point. Those are our biggest, I mean, during the Marshall Fire, that's been a huge mm -hmm. conversation around it. Fire department, probably, I don't know. It's just our, our own staff, or if you want to put Parks and Rec, because they're the ones under it have to be included in there because the nat our natural risk is our open spaces with all the grass. Do you want to make it more specific just to city staff and departments? Would you still want to include the other elements out there in the community? Just specify within that 
objective instead of city staff list out those departments and individuals. Well, to be specific so that we know that it gets done, they na need to name the ones that are involved in it. Any thoughts for anyone else? What does top five mean? Top five, uh, thank you, that's a great question. I will zoom back over to my note here. So that would mean moving from, of 18 local communities on the front range that took the same survey and had that same or similar question, Westminster ranked six out of 18, one being the best. So this would mean moving into fifth place, doing things that the next time a survey went around, <clears throat> you gained fifth. I think I put these both up here because there's been some conversation with council that you don't necessarily want to compare yourself to other communities because you have some different things going on. So the other option is to do that average rating, which really speaks specifically to your community. These are resident opinions of our preparedness. Is that how other communities rate themselves or are we looking for something that's a little more objective for ourselves to be looking toward? You could certainly have staff define something that's very objective and internal. I think that would probably make this one that you would need some benchmarking metrics around. So I think my recommendation, if that's how you would want to do it, which I think is a good way to go for this performance and outcome measure for not the entire strategic plan, but this first annual kind of performance measures chunk, maybe that is the performance measure and outcome to establish benchmark metrics that you have something to measure against moving forward. Mayor, if I could, uh, one question or observation I'd offer, um, the natural environment. Um, I think there was some discussion among staff as potentially not only fires, but flooding, um, storm related, um, even seismic issues are sort of a, a range of risks that the NIMS um, training could be applied to. Um, so it, just a, a thought that it wasn't necessarily targeting one natural hazard, but there was a range of, of risks. I just know the one had, that has risen to the top since January is our open space. Unless the dam breaks, we'll be fine with plenty. I'll let you know how that works. <laughs> Out of your home. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> so that second focus objective says collaboratively, mm -hmm. and it mentions residents. How exactly? So, but the measure, but there's no measure, and how exactly? It doesn't need to be precise, but what is the plan to collaborate with residents on this? Just shouldn't there be some kind of measure? a measure of the plan to collaborate. Uh, you certainly could put that in. I think with those kind of metrics, it sometimes falls into the realm of implementation and how staff plans to work collaboratively with. And that becomes more of just, a, and some of these you will see that because you're establishing benchmarks and things, but it is more of how staff plans to work collaboratively. And do you just want to hear that staff is holding meetings on a quarterly basis, or they're forming some kind of hazard mitigation focus group that gets participation, because that's certainly something that you can put in here, but that's also gets a little bit into the realm of just how staff is going to be achieving these overall objectives. So another way to, to uh, say that would be, that would be talking about how to get there, whereas the KPI is the performance indicator is what we achieved which is the, the different ratings or the measures of how we've done in the view of the residents participating in the survey. But then the measure should then reflect how we have the outcome, right? If we're saying we're collaboratively, 
specifically, then the, the outcome should reflect that. In other words, should we, if this is going to be a collaborative, you know, that word is very specific. We say that a lot and we don't always do it. So I don't want to just say words just because it sounds nice. I'd rather, so what do we, I think we might need an outcome then, um, a measurable out, outcome that shows that the staff did work, that would measure that somehow. Don't you think if we got a poor score from the residents, though, that would show that we didn't? Is that what I'm hearing? Johnny is like, if we get a high score, then we feel that, you know, the residents must feel that we worked, worked well with them to, to mitigate they risk. They worked well with them. That they are aware of what the city is doing in terms of hazard mitigation regards. So again, this is when we talked about with staff a little bit, because what the survey is measuring and what the city's intention. Your intention is you want to improve hazard mitigation and mm -hmm. make the city safer all around and do that with community participants. But how community or even people in this room may define hazard mitigation really varies a lot. So one of the ways you can measure it is just that awareness, which I think we've talked about a lot throughout mm -hmm. our time together making sure the community is aware of what's going on, they understand what's going on, and there's some kind of outlet for them to be communicating. And that's what this survey would really measure. Like, are they more aware of what's going on and what the city is doing in terms of hazard mitigation? So this, this rating is a resident one. So maybe there's something with the business survey that we do that... I don't have all of those questions. elements. Yeah. You can certainly do that and say that you wanted to have, I think we have a couple of other areas where we talk about some business ratings. So if that's something that a business survey is put together, that's a question that could be incorporated. So you're getting that element of it. I know Jody's going to work on this anyway, so I know he's taking notes with our comments. I just think that we just need to remind ourselves that we're at the top level, right? And not to get so in the weeds as far as like how it gets done and um, just to make sure that we're at the policy level doing things um, and overseeing that level and not trenching in the All right, so this is one specific to employee engagement and effectiveness, strengthen city workforce resilience, effectiveness, and strong culture around the city's mission, vision, guiding principles, and spirit values to contribute to the well being, engagement, and retention of the city's workforce. <coughs> There's a secondary one there continue to provide mental health <coughs> for the city's workforce with particular focus on public safety personnel to adjust to address job related stress. And the reason that I've merged these two boxes together for this performance measure, and there's another one in another priority that references this Gallup P12 employee engagement survey. The city is switching over to that employee engagement survey this year. It's going to give some pretty rich data around um, employee engagement. How many times can you say that phrase in 30 seconds or less? And really give the organization some good insight into where staff is, um, effectiveness, what staff feel like they need, what it might take to retain staff more effectively. So I think this is something I would recommend you get those survey results in and use those as benchmarks for moving forward. Because it's some pretty rich data and it's completely different survey than the city's done in the past. So it's not going to be comparable to a lot of the things that have been existing. Yeah. Not to get too, too in the weeds, but I am on this specific area. When we talk about employee engagement and retention and all those things, and specifically with certain departments we've been talking about over the last couple of months, if you are only measuring uh, organization-wide, it looks skewed compared to the department. So I just want to make sure that when we look at the measurement that we're looking department by department so that we have a better heat map if we have a, a problem area in the organization. 
Uh, I'd agree with that. I also think that um, slightly in the weeds, but if you're looking at your turnover rate based on issues identified in an exit interview, I think you've already kind of lost that, you know, they're gone. Um, so I don't know how effective that is versus focusing in on the issues that are identified in um, the employee satisfaction one. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that that exit interview information can provide some insightful information transitionally. Um, for staff who may be leaving the organization over the course of the year while you're getting that engagement survey data in, it gives you a little bit of insight. And then when you get that data in, you'll be able to see if there are correlations, if it really supports some of those exit interviews. It just makes the case even stronger once you get the survey. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because sometimes people aren't going to be honest. Yeah. They are when they're on their way out the door. So. Measuring against both, I think, is a smart idea. Right, because we could have the same turnover rate, but the reasons could change. So right now we're finding uh, retirement, family relocations, um, just leaving the workforce earlier than thought, uh, right? But if we track those as well as the rate of uh, departure, we can see if there's any shifts in the reasons why people are either leaving um, or whatnot. Just to ask, uh, we'll get in the weeds because that's why we're here. Well, they to look at these performance measures. Um, shouldn't that be quantitative a little bit more? So I know it's outside of our control. It's a little bit outside of our control, right? But there are some things that we have that we can do. So should that be a little more quantitative versus just an increase? Doesn't it? It's, Yes, ideally. It's, yes. A, it, it's hard <laughs> to the number. I understand. Yeah. But I think ideally, yes. And I think staff wants it to be more quantitative, but they want to have some good data to base it yeah. off of. So I think what you'll see in further iterations, and I know this is a five year strategic plan, but some of these goals, so you establish benchmarks this year, you can then get that quantitative measure for next year and things like that's what they're hoping for with a lot of these, where you don't see a quantitative to establish that quantitative amount, then you have something to compare and track against moving forward. You know, we'll, uh, thank you, Council, for, for that question. We'll, you know, what we can do is look at, we we'll talk with HR and see if there's, for example, a 10 year average or a five year average preceding, I would say, COVID, um, and see if there's a, a way to say it, you know, if that's lower than what we, we have now, maybe set that as a potential uh, target as a performance measure to return to our pre-COVID average or something like that. Um, so we'll look at those numbers and if we can find one that's already historically supported, we'll, we'll advance it for your consideration. Do you else have any comments on that kind of objectives? All right. Next one is to create a redevelopment toolkit to encourage private sector investment, business growth, community resiliency and adaptive reuse. And there are a couple of performance measures in here. First one is to have that redevelopment toolkit created by December of 2023. Pause there and get reactions or questions. I was thinking, um, because we have so much uh, kind of commercial space that could be adaptively reused, that it would be good to call it redevelopment and adaptive reuse toolkit. Um, so, you know, I don't want to discount the fact that we have so much opportunity for that. What does that mean? Adaptive reuse. Yeah. It could be like any of our older commercial centers, like, I don't know, the names now, Brook Hill Center or something, um, just being able to. You know, reuse those. Like we have a okay, 128th and Zuna a bank left. Could it be reused for a restaurant? Um, and what might we be able to put into a, a toolkit like this? It's not redeveloping. We're adaptively re reusing this building. And are there? Well, I think as long as we put it in a grease trap, that's fine, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what will be in this. I'm just. <laughs> I'm, I am just encouraging us to 
highlight adaptive producing <laughs> that. May, may I add uh, both <laughs> counselors? That's that's a great point. That's a great example. Uh, that would probably be in the adaptive uh, reuse toolkit, which is, uh, it, which is to re-examine our um, grease trap requirements, which we are actively doing um, with a case, uh, at least two cases in point. So that would be an example. Uh, a more a more um, direct one for city council would be recently the um, Marzac Fine Foods coming into a former bank building and taking the U.S. bank building and adaptively reusing it. So without scraping it to the ground and rebuilding uh, or redeveloping, it would be uh, rebuilt, redoing the interior and the HVAC systems and such to turn it into uh, a grocery store instead of a bank. So that would be an example that council has been involved in recently. But there are many things. How does that differ from really redevelopment? So you don't you don't you don't um, scrape the building. You don't take a you don't take a building and um, scrape it, re-excavate the, the 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 site, build a new foundation and a whole new building. You use what was already built, and in this case, I think that was built in the seventies or eighties. Um, and you don't view that as just all part of the redevelopment spectrum. Mm -hmm. just, just, just words. Like it's like adaptive <laughs> reuse, like Vasa, where the Safeway is, or. Flat Irons Church, where there used to be a Walmart. But I, too, you know, this is just a toolkit. So if a business comes here and says, "I, I need X number of square footage and X Y Z," what do you have in your inventory? Boom, we've got it. You know, without a scrape. Well, I one of the other examples in like that kind of scenario churches I've, I've heard from a couple different churches that they've had a really hard time being able to get into the city where we have plenty of space that probably would be fine uh, quarters for, for churches um, but our you know whatever kind of rules we have um, have gotten in the way of that I mean I don't know I want it's to, maybe easier than Greece check yeah, yeah and I mean that gets into my, my second point you haven't got to the second one but you have here realize 100 million in private sector investment. I, I don't know that I really like an arbitrary number because then we're trying to hit a target that maybe the market's not going to drive to. I want, I want the, the need to be there in order for us to say what the toolkit is. So if you have a church, we're going to try to match you with the place that makes sense for a church. You know, if you have a, a saddle business, do we have anything that if it's a saddle business? I mean, we to, to me, we're setting ourselves up to either drive to objectives that that maybe aren't there otherwise. Does that make sense? What I'm saying, like it, it should be market and needs driven for people who want to come and be part of the city. It shouldn't be because it fits an arbitrary number goal. Did the number come from something like from years past that we were looking at? We all went to Lindsay. <laughs> Our, uh, Lindsay Kimball will join us on this on this set. Uh, what? Oh, please. Yeah. Um, it, and if I could just, just back up a, a second as well. And I apologize because I was probably speaking Floridian when I wrote redevelopment toolkit. Um, we did not have a distinction between redevelopment and adaptive reuse. They were synonyms to us. So I apologize. And I just, I want you to know that, um, you know, absolutely 100% didn't, didn't intend for that to sound like we were going to scrape everything. I think adaptive reuse is the most responsible um, type of redevelopment or type of activity that, that you can do. So I, sorry, I just wanted to get that out there. And uh, to answer your question, so it is hard to come up with a number, right? Because we, we haven't had a um, defined toolkit in the past. So what we tried to do was look at, okay, before COVID, what, what were we doing on an annual basis? Um, and then looking forward and knowing what's in the pipeline and what, what might be a potential candidate for a redevelopment program, what does that look like? Um, it's, it's difficult because it's never going to be a straight line. It's going to be a very volatile amount. So if you were trying to find a pin it on a number on an annual average. Honestly, that's very difficult just because of cycles in the real estate market, um, large economic forces we can't control. So if you did want to do that at some point, I'd recommend a rolling average to, to do something like that to even out that volatility. Um, 
But that's, that is where that 100 million came from. We said, okay, five years, what do we think we could reasonably accomplish? So, so here's a suggestion and, and a couple of examples. To me, I feel like, and obviously the, I need three more people to agree with this, but if you listen to what um, our residents that live here say, is they're sick of, you know, all the rebuilding with all the empty space. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the term adaptive reuse is appealing. Um, but if you're going to look at that in terms of a target, the target should be less empty space. And I don't think that the residents are going to, you know, that makes more sense to a resident to say, our target is to have X percent less, of, you know, empty retail or commercial space or whatever it is. And it makes, it makes more of a, to me, that makes more sense of what, what we would want to go after. Um, but it also has to match desires and needs of the community. I'll give you another example. Forever and ever, people complained about the empty builder square. Now there's a lot of apartments. I don't hear less complaining. It's just a different complaint it's because people aren't happy with the amount of apartments that are there. So, I mean, they're we, ugly. Yeah, we, <laughs> they, they don't look as pretty as the rendering, I'll say. But um, the point of being is, you know, that that's more of a, to me, is more of a measurable thing that I would be um, open to as something like, you know, X amount less um, vacancy. vacancy, because I, that's more what I've heard. I don't know about my colleagues, but that sure. I, I think that the number isn't going to be what is, you know, what the residents would want us to go after. I could get behind that, yeah, a reduced yeah. vacancy. Yeah. Commercial space. Still, it's still a lot of that makes sense. Commercial Yeah. How much of this is tied into the property owners? Because really, they have the biggest vested interest to advance or redevelop or whatever the heck you want to rent their space. But but to that point, Bruce, this is back to my point I was making. We have had a, a a system where we are, say, the TOD. Great example. When I have both met with the gentleman who owns the the saddlery down there, he has half a space that's open. He's went 10, through thousand square feet. He's went through multiple tenants that he turned away because they didn't fit what we think should be there. Opposed to, he had tenants that wanted to lease out the space. So, to me, so the city turned away his tenants. Yes. You're correct. So what reason? I don't I don't know all the reasons. You'd have to ask him. I just know that that's what he shared with with me, and he shared that with the mayor. Well, if they were a tattoo parlor, I could understand oh, as that's outlawed. But for how oh, dare you? <laughs> <laughs> but no, but with all, business, with all seriousness, though, if if your goal is to reduce vacancy, there's more of a there's more of an a, a, a incentive for the city as an organization to say, we want to match open space with the tenant that we know is looking for a space. So if I'm a tenant and I come to economic development and say, hey, here's the kind of business I want to bring to your city in the space, you know, if they're doing a good job about knowing what's vacant with property owners, they're going to be able to marry them together. I just, you make, I, I, I just want, this is fine, this is fine. So I had a question on timing, on the measures here. So the to, the redevelopment toolkit created by the end of next year. Mm -hmm. What's the driver behind that? Time seems pretty far out. And and isn't the strategic plan supposed to be? Well, I'm sure not for everything, but as much as we can within the year. No, the strategic plan is actually a little. It's a little bit more longer term than that. So you'll have the overall strategic plan about five years, but you'll have built into that some measures that are one-year measures, some measures Actionable that are two-year measures, per year right, so that you can see some week. movement. But what you're hoping for is that scroll back up there. For these broader, the council objectives that are a little bit the more visionary ones that are broad, those are the things that you're going to want to have um, measures that are about your five-year range. And then your staff's focused objectives kind of nest into those. Some of them are a little bit more longer term, and particularly when it comes to the economic development ones, those are generally a little bit more longer term. 
it takes a little bit more time to really start seeing kind of the fruits of your labor when it comes to some of those things. And that's why you'll see throughout this plan, some things have a longer timeline. And then there are some things that you can accomplish within a year because they move you closer to that goal and kind of build upon one another. But operationally, when you have a long timeline, you still need to know how you're going to get there, right? And when I look at this end of next year to develop the toolkit, I'm just curious why that would take so 20 something months. Is there a reason? What, how that day came about? Um, so um, we certainly would want to get it done sooner and as fast as possible. Um, some of the, the challenges that we have right now are staffing. Um, so the two positions that would be very uh, integral in developing this and interfacing with the development community and property owners to make sure that it was a toolkit that was accessible and, and meaningful for them. You know, so we, we weren't just creating it in a vacuum, but um, having the, I think the private sector inputs can be really important. Those two positions are currently vacant. Um, we're trying to move as fast as possible as other departments are to fill those, but it, it's primarily um, a capacity issue right now. Um, would be happy to prioritize it um, in a different way. You know, whatever direction we receive, it's fine. Um, and, but we do need to leave some time so that we can engage with the property owners and the private sector to understand what the challenges are to certain properties, um, adaptively being adaptively reused or um, some other improvement. Because I think it, you know, in my experience of creating these toolkits, um, that input is very valuable because you don't want to spend a whole bunch of time and then create something and then no one uses it or is like, well, why'd you do it like this? We told you, you know, we needed a roof program and you made a facade program or you know, something like that. And then also coming back, obviously, to this body for approval of the document. So, so staff that coming out each, if that makes sense. Uh, may I add, uh, Lindsay's being um, probably a little bit polite, the, the economic development team is, is quite likely the hardest hit team in terms of turnover in this city, um, the vacancy rates. Um, when we brought Lindsay on board, we're probably the lowest of any employee group. 50%. 50% vacancy. So she is uh, rebuilding as, uh, as you know, vigorously as she can, but I, this, this is what has affected that performance indicator. Um, we could advance it, I, I think, um, a quarter, sure. um, you know, get, get a little bit more aggressive, um, you know, bring it in uh, at the end of Q3 of, of 23, that would give us 12 months. Um, but we would also try to exceed that, come, come in before then. I'm sorry, just curious, how big is the staff right now? Um, we currently have eight people. And it's 50% we had? You were down to? 16? Yeah, we, we've rehired some okay. folks. Um, our full strength is 12. Um, one, one thing on the even if we don't put, realize 100 million in private sector investment, I think reporting on private sector investment is kind of like, you know, that's not really a, you know much of a goal. So I, I don't know if there's some type of in between where we're saying we cover private sector investments or you know some way to say there's a heartbeat. Um, we're measuring it. Uh, yeah, just an encouragement for us. You know, like a, a goal out there. Maybe it doesn't have to be exactly 100 million. Yeah. I understand. Okay. Yeah. I would be that there. Anyone else? Moving on? I know, but it's kind of like, it's exciting. It's really cool. <laughs> Can we give them a goal? Like, go. <laughs> All right. So, uh, sorry. Sure. <laughs> that second one, that second focused objective, the measures, the reports. Mm -hmm. That what's the frequency? When? Who's the audience? Is it annual report? Is it just the, the second? You're month? reporting on existing jobs. Yeah, and the report on the all the reports. When are when and where? When and who? 
Um, we anticipated those to be annual. Um, the data is only published quarterly um, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, so we couldn't be any more frequent than that. And, and who targeted the industries? Um, those are in concert with OEDIT, our state economic development partner. Um, so the state has broad categories and then additionally Metro Denver EDC targets in on specialized areas for the front, front range of industries that both have the potential for growth, are um, consistent with our labor force or compatible complementary to the existing labor force and um, have that potential for growth. And we don't report now. We, sorry. Oh, sorry. We don't report. We don't do any reporting now on any of this. We, we do have an annual report, which breaks down all industries. Um, it doesn't specifically call out the targeted, um, what we call mm -hmm. mixed codes, or um, that's the national standard for classifications of the industries. Okay, so we talk about getting um, primary employment, i.e. good paying jobs in the city um, for our employed residents. Um, it's just a good goal, but also isn't, isn't the other side of that um, to attract employers, we have to have housing and an amenity base that actually people basically affordable living in Westminster to attract these employers. So are we looking at that side of things? So that was not um, something, and I'm sorry, can you scroll up? Because I can't see what the, I've got the wording for the name. Um, So we, my team honed in on business community here. So I guess I would just defer to, you know, this body if you wanted to broaden, you know, well, what impact should be measured. You've got, you know, you have a lot of employers, whether they're primary employers or just employers, like trying to run a restaurant that can't hire people. And we can't hire people because there's just, no one can afford to live in the area. So what are we doing about that? It's not one of our strategic objectives. It kind of is because if we're talking about supporting the business community, I guess we're just saying, well, high five you. Well, we just, we I mean, we just approved voting for two. That's the, probably the biggest housing developments that we've seen in, in how long as far as single family homes. I mean, I don't, I don't feel like there's room for us to be making that a specific target in my opinion. Can I suggest something on that one? That So yes, you're 100% right that you do need to focus on kind of both sides of the coin with that one. But that is a really big in Denver, in Denver, endeavor uh, to have wrapped in to the first year of the strategic plan. And what I would suggest is that maybe midway through your five year cycle, that becomes one of the things that you look at again. Have we made enough progress in this area or kind of standardized our reporting and established our benchmarks and how we're working with the business community here to start introducing some more of those focused staff objectives? And maybe they are around affordable housing and things like that. Not that it doesn't need to be addressed now in Metro Denver, that's certainly a concern, but I think to have both of those things in the plan it's going to make both of them less effective. You're not going to have enough capacity within the community or within staff to really focus wholeheartedly on either one and make some good progress. I don't see how we don't mention how we don't mention housing. Because we made that this well made because that this well because if you want that to be a goal, we get to vote on the goal, and I don't think. There's enough people to vote on the goal. I think you're just pulling this affordable housing in because it is tangentially connected to jobs. I mean, yeah, the connection is there, but 
No, I mean, we were talking about how we help businesses make business. If we are talking about affordable housing, that should be its own separate thing. And we're just slowing down the discussion and, and wasting our time. Well, we've no. not even gone through one thing. We got four more to go. It's not a waste of time because Jody said one of our objectives here is to look at the objectives too. It's the, it's the final look at the objectives. I don't want to look at affordable housing. I think one of the objectives of tonight was to finalize the focused objectives of staff. Because I think we've gone through and council has really gone through and approved those broad council objectives. And the work tonight was really supposed to be just making sure that we captured any revisions or changes during that last book session and make sure that these performance metrics were on track or get some direction from council, correct? No, I agree. I think that's where some of the frustration is coming from because yeah. we we had our goal set set out, like like them or not. The majority of council set the goal. These are the objectives. And to your point, this is fine tuning. So my recommendation would be not that affordable housing gets completely taken off of the table for five years, but that it is not a specific objective reflected in this plan. That's something that Council's talked about quite a bit, and we've done a lot of work to make sure that these objectives are where you all wanted them, and we're just kind of fine-tuning in language in those focus points. Uh, just one more piece there, and it's really related to climate action. I think when we talk about the creative, to create a structured system of support, Medicare has to promote resiliency and not having a climate action focused objective seems like a miss. So we're acknowledging we agree that there's a miss in our objectives overall. Right. Not that you guys agree. I just think it's a huge, huge miss. Do you? I have to ask because do you think that every single thing that the city does needs to be in the current objective? There were former objectives, such as the sustainability department, that is there now. Those things are being tackled. These are things that this council needs to tackle in the next couple of years. We have dog licenses in there. So we're going down to the level of dog licenses. I think we can have climate action. But it's we just, as a body decided not to. And that's 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 all I was saying. That I, I know we agreed, but just to raise that point again, it's a huge mess. And we have low level things in here, so it's not like we're we're flowing in climate action. It's we have a lot of things. But that to add like not being addressed is is disingenuous at best. And Councillor Azadi, one thing that I would like to point out that we talked a little bit about, and I will scroll to the end of the document because I think it not a hundred percent addressed your concern, but it does get to part of it. Um, a lot of the sorry to make everybody cross this and scroll here. Mm -hmm. There we go. So at the end of the document, staff went through and really crosswalked things that were kind of ongoing or had been objectives in previous plans or initiatives and things that were now just embedded in, in staff work and the way that staff looks at things and kind of the lens through which they see things. And sustainability is one of those things. So it doesn't 100% address your point, but let me see if I can find the... All right, so here's one, incorporate sustainability best practices that reduce energy and resource use through direct city and community actions. An example of that was to update the Unified Development Code. So well, some of those things are being captured in kind of the ongoing, this is the way staff approaches all of the work that they do. Thanks for trying to make it better. <laughs> it's not helping, but I I, I do appreciate it. It is embedded in there a little bit. I know you want a specific well, because, it's not, because it was a former objective. And so those things are now embedded in everything that the city does because it was a former objective. Okay, let's get moving on. Okay. All right, so the last one for this priority was to provide four workshops annually for local businesses on the subject of workforce development resources, tools, and grant programs. Okay. 
Okay. I see nobody. Let's get on to priority two. All right. So foster safe and livable housing through proactive code enforcement and rental housing inspections. This one, there was some conversation in this group at the last work session uh, about the different kind of measures. So with staff, we created 15% increase in staff initiated versus community initiated enforcement touch points in the first year. And to kind of balance that measure and see where overall uh, community voluntary compliance with the code was, they've added that, but it gives you a little bit uh, more insight. We're trying to increase it. Yeah, to increase voluntary compliance. How are we defining touch point? So typically, code enforcement is to be initiated. And we recall somebody called you know, um, for the code violation. This would be code enforcement proactively going out and making those contacts. With so each contact is a touch point uh, or in person. Yeah, so the touch point is either the, a resident, uh, typically, or a business uh, contacts us. That's a touch point. Um, staff initiated is the staff would go out uh, on their own um, and identify a need for a compliance uh, at a property. I'm going to assume that going to be hiring staff to do that because usually cities are staffed just to accommodate calls like a pretty thin resource that we usually have we're not we're not necessarily making that connection so this could be restructuring the way that we um, you know one of the ways to interpret this measure is that we reduce the number of complaints from our community by being more proactive ourselves with problem areas, problem house, for example, we would be more taking more initiative there to reduce the number of, and that would shift the percentage, shift the percent relative percentage between the two. And it may be more efficient for us to do that rather than continually receiving, for example, complaints from a problem house for five years. We may decide to get more aggressive uh, as to the extent that we can with our ordinance. Um, and that may cut down four years of complaints coming at us. And that would change the percentage of staff percent uh, initiated versus resident complaints. So that's another way to look at that KPI is, is to not make it necessary for the mayor to call uh, or for you to call because that actually got dealt with through a voluntary compliance after a staff contact. One way, hopefully it goes. All right, the next one, increase the use of technologies and non-commissioned public safety services by leveraging positions such as co-responders, homeless navigators, and non-sworn report writers. One thing I'd like to point out here in blue, you see that new word technologies. In working with staff, they felt it was important to make sure that technologies got included because there are some upcoming technologies that are going to help the police department do that report writing that would cut down and how much time they spend anyway. So they just wanted to make sure that was recognized and transparent in their form. Because there have been technologies in the past that increased their time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so is that just referring to report writing, that technologies word? Yes. Can that be closer to tie together? Because it's Yeah, dense. absolutely. And do we only have one KPI for, for there's a lot of things in there, like co-responders, co navigators. Do we want to put something in there? To, um... We could. Um, we certainly can. I think when we wrote it like this, we were thinking about what council's original intention behind these objectives were. And one of them was that your police officers could spend more time in the field versus time doing administrative tasks. So we could certainly say um, expand it to all of those different categories. The overall intention is really that they're out in the field more, right? Decrease the number of reports taken. Question for the fire department. I, I, I know that one of their biggest needs is a behavioral health specialist. Because they have a lot of issues related to that. 
um, from the work. Is there a way, we, can we add that in to that list of so co-responders, navigators, behavioral health specialists? I think it's in this mental health one. The very first page continues to learn about what resources to this is, what course. I just want to call it out more specifically here because we're calling out. Because this is for the police department. I thought I read one that you do have it in the other place. It could be called, you know, it could be more specifically called out in the, on the first page, you know, where we have multiple fire department ones it's on the bottom. Front page folk. Here, and you know you can call it out. Oh, call out there. Yeah. Can we add that in there? Any objections to that? No objections. Where are we? First page is resources. So objective number two. Focus objective number two. After tonight, we are going to number these. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. <laughs> I want to take notes. I have yesterday. I've already in my head. I'm remembering these numbers. No, I don't want to see this again. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen this too many times. <laughs> <laughs> I love the dialogue. I love dialogue. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I need to share with you Monty Python's The Art. I've seen that. So the next. Uh, the this is that. The next focus objective, ensure recruitment, training, and retention strategies for the police department. And that language has changed. It was public safety before. Staff requested that we make this specific police department to ensure that Westminster is a desired place of employment. This one we, again, have tied to that Gallup uh, Q12 survey. And once those results come in and they have that data, this can be refined, but they really want to have that data to specify department by department, as you talked about a little earlier. And I have been advised by uh, HR following the earlier question um, or comp discussion about this, this can be broken down by department, these measures. Gallup gives us that department by department. Have we ever thought about for fire and police personnel, like a down payment assistance program? Some cities are doing this now to help um, Retain. I think we have a uh, hundred applicants for our fire department for each opening, don't we? I think the fire department is one of the most sought after jobs in Colorado, isn't it? Okay, then police. I mean, I'm just trying to think of like, you know, if we set ourselves apart and have something that keeps people or attracts people. Most officers don't like to live in the city that they police. <laughs> oh, it doesn't have to be in the city. It's just a down payment assistance. Oh, right now we're giving them a ten thousand dollar bonus. Okay. Next. All right. The next set are focused around um, people experiencing homelessness, and I know we had a quite a discussion around this. So we put some very specific targets in here and also made sure that, because one of the things council was concerned about was making sure that you kind of take care of it, um, continuum of care really, and that you start out with care, resources, support, but then at some point, where does the enforcement come in and how are you tracking? I think getting that system into place is really what a lot of these are focused around. So the first one is to decrease uh, the percentage decrease in homelessness within the veteran population, specifically within the city. You know, Councilor Izzati, you had a question about why we're just focusing on that group and not others. And one of the reasons for that is because it's tracked right now. Yeah. Not all of those different Our partners are. are tracking that, and that is their number one in Adams County, and we are a partner in that, and we will probably hit that goal by the end of the year. It's also paid for by the federal government. Yes. Yeah, a great deal of assistance opportunities too. Yeah. yeah. And once they hit the zero for um, veterans, we'll go to the next. So the next. So we're only focusing on that though? There's another the one. column down. Yeah, there's a couple in here. Well, there are a couple of others that staff 
put in that they thought would be really salient to these objectives. So this next one is the number of beds, rooms, or permanent supportive housing or other programs that the city funds or contributes towards people experiencing homelessness to legally and safely stay. So that kind of helps out with that transitional housing and some of the questions you had earlier tonight around yes. the different resources. Greater than 10 rooms. That, that would be our goal. <laughs> Isn't that the opposite goal? Shouldn't our goal be to reduce the number of rooms we give away? No, to have more options than just 10 hotel rooms to turn people to. And if a hotel has already said, no, we're not taking that person again, we have some other options. I think that's just encouraging more people to come here. But we've had this discussion. They can move on. The word can continue. Mm -hmm. If we're lacking the amount of options, should that word be more, like increase, out more sources sort of thing versus continue the current state? I think we need more options. I think continuing to work with them as they try to find more options is the point. It's just no more options doing, available. Yeah, we're doing that with Arvada. Yep. Building a big complex. Yeah, so. Jeffco is making more. Adams County is on the, they're starting their process. And we're putting money into it. So it takes time. We're a partner. All right, the next one, the objective, develop processes and protocols that clearly communicate available resources and allow the city to easily identify when resolution has been reached and or enforcement is required. And this is the one that we refined language to really respond to the council's discussion at the last work session. So the measure associated with that is to establish a baseline measurement since it's newly up and running using a full year of Westminster specific data in that homeless management information system. So once you have a full year of data, you'll have a baseline with and then staff can revise and give you some goals. Next one is a similar performance measurement. And it's to continue to research best practices and policies developed at the state level to address the causes of homelessness, employ those best practices around trauma-informed care when homelessness does occur, and provide recommendations for changes in city policies and procedures that may help address source issues in align with best practice. This one, it's a little bit wordy. I feel like I want to cut down about half of the words in there, but the intention is really to speak to Mayor what you asked at the last meeting. What can we do with, with while still being in compliance with code? And where are those best practices and how can we address the situation and help those things while remaining within code? I would expand that though, because I think the intent I heard from the mayor and certainly the intent I would want is where code is a is the barrier. To somebody like a church who wants to provide reasonable care that that we're not getting in their way with that that would be my my thought and that's what i heard in the conversation so it's good to know what we can do within code but it's also good to know where the code gets in the way much like we're doing with the uh revising the code for climate stuff you need to have like a temporary stay code amendment or evaluate that or the state put in um, parking in a parking lot, and we have two churches that are allowing that in their um, in their buildings and well in their parking lots. But some are going beyond, and some have uh, one has a gym and so has showers available, and lets them come in, provides towels and stuff, <clears throat> and uh, one and lets them come in and use the restroom. And then one doesn't have those capabilities, but has a porta potty so they have access to a bathroom during the night. So um, some are doing that because in, even in the most severe weather, we don't, we don't have codes that allow people to come in and get warm or get cold or get cool in the air conditioning. So like temporary shelter or you know, something. Let me thank you for the clarification on this one, because I think what I'll do, I had originally 
written out the one that you see highlighted with my note here, identify mechanisms to allow for service provision while remaining in compliance. I want to revise the language on this to reflect what you just said, with that clarification that makes it. So I'll revise that. Did they die outside in the cold or worry about the one and however many chance of having a fire in a building that doesn't meet building code for having somebody else in the place? I mean, does it really matter? Number three. All right, on to number three. The first focus objective, to develop and implement citywide events that foster camaraderie and community connections through neighborhood participation. Performance and outcome measure, 70% of annually scheduled city events will prioritize a neighborhood audience or be locally focused. Mayor, I know you had some question about uh, the lead being the communication team for several of these. And that really encompasses your uh, special events coordination and cultural, cultural affairs. Cultural affairs. Thank you. So it really wraps in several different staff functional groups under that communication team. That's reason. Really, the but community. Is this a PRL function? Well, that's what I thought. And and if we're if we're measuring folks, it's who who owns the event, and it's not communication that owns the event. Is in my head. But all those people got wrapped in. Events last year. got pulled out of PRL. Yeah, events yeah. got pulled out of PRL. Have been. We can revise this to better reflect. Yeah, that's not a problem. So who does events? Well, we, events is, uh, Councilor Seymour is correct. Uh, special events and cultural was moved from uh, Parks, Rec, and Libraries into uh, the Innovation and Communication Division. That was that was a, that was a chunk of the, the, the large increase that showed up in that team. That was done. Yeah, some bigger policy 18 months ago. About 18 months ago. That, so, but we will work on that, Mayor, That the, the way that that showed up as, a, as the lead. Yeah, well, I think part of it is, Mayor, didn't we want to eliminate the communications team? I think, I think we've talked about it several times in my recollection. That was that $1.9 million addition to the budget. But that's not a discussion we're willing to have tonight. Gotcha. That is a discussion we should have at some But we still have people that are responsible for that. We just have to identify them. But I will be, I'll change that to better specify which the right division or staff is actually handling those duties. Yeah. What are they? Innovation and communication teams and their CM and mm -hmm. kind of its own department, right? Pardon me? Communication team is not a department. It's Correct. under the city manager. It's a division not in the city manager's office. What does the metric actually mean? Like, uh, prioritize a neighborhood audience. I think that that's speaking towards wanting to have things throughout the city and not just in a couple of locations. They really wanted to focus on using some of those neighborhood HOA associations and having things that are more out in the community than not really described very well. But not just focus on a couple of clubs within the city and making sure that these events are taking place all over the city so that community members from across the city can actually come to them. So we mean, we mean diversity of neighborhoods? Okay. Next one, ensure that Westminster's events and programs represent and are inclusive to the city's rich cultural diversity. And this is that at least five community events annually will highlight culturally diverse performances and or vendors. It's kind of vague. Yeah, what do we mean? Um, uh, Wouldn't we want to ensure all of our events highlight culturally diverse vendors? Why are we specifying it just to five? It should well, be part of the land that we have annually. 
Do you have any idea? That's a good question, sir. We do. We we haven't for two years had any. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. yeah. So we're just picking up all those pieces, and we we weren't sure what the campus was going to look like for okay. COVID and so even this year. Was a good well, right. but, but can we just say all of them? Well, because think about it in terms of this. I just went to the adult Easter egg hunt. That's not really a cultural event. That's just a fun, goofy event versus a Latino festival that's or a multicultural event that is specifically laid out to do highlight people's cultures. So like not every like the beer fest, that's not going to be something that's going to be specified on a culture, specified on as many good beers as they can get in. in but the but this this doesn't say cultural events. It says highlight culturally diverse performances and vendors. And or vendors. Vendors are in all events. So my my my, my question is, wouldn't we want to have, have that be the lens as to how we view everything, as much as we can in every event? We should always have some culturally diverse vendors. I agree. I don't think it's that hard to you know, incorporate that in. So that everybody feels like they're. I guess what 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 does that mean? Like, what is culture like? Am I different if I'm a vendor? Does that mean I'm not culturally diverse because I'm white and a woman, or is it because I'm white and a woman that it's culturally diverse? Like, I don't understand what that means. Like, <laughs> instead of vendors, maybe pull up a little bit from vendors. Maybe focus on the events themselves. Maybe you want to have five community events that are. Lake Mayor Pro Tem DeMott said that are specific culturally focused events throughout the community. Because when you get to vendors, that costs money and people have to make choices. And small businesses can't afford what normally the city charges for. Them. At least if you want local. If you want anybody in the metro area, you probably can find somebody. But if you want to stick with helping local people, you start tart. You start narrowing the field because of the cost. I, I, I like the idea of pulling it up because I think it's unreasonable to say vendors. Because I know you talk talk to the folks that put on these events, and sometimes they're begging to get like say they have a food truck event. I mean, those food trucks are super busy all the time. So if you're gonna say, okay, we want you to get ten food trucks, now we, we need you to fit these cultural. Um, Groups. I mean, that's going to be very difficult to do at a vendor level. I think inclusivity is difficult. That's the purpose of inclusivity. It's not. I mean, we shouldn't just do what's easy. We should do what's right. And saying that we would like, or we would encourage, or we would try to have more inclusive X Y Z. There's nothing wrong with that just because it's hard. Oh, I don't have a problem with striving for it. I have a problem with demanding it. No one's demanding it. I'm asking why aren't we doing this for everything? We should have a guidance. We should have a guidance that the, that this is the, the lens we, we take this is we want to be as inclusive as possible. Um, because those cultural vendors actually have a much harder time getting gigs. Maybe it's like not saying at least five, but we just say, you know, strive to include or highlight cultural diverse performances and vendors in all of our events. Um, and then we could just see how we do. With no metric, just leave it. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Yeah, Are you guys okay with that? that? I feel like you're going backwards on your cause, but sure. Because now it has got no teeth in it. It just, we're always gonna, and then if that's the case, then fine. Let's just always do that and not have it an objective in our strategic. Well, you know, it's, it's in there and it's, you know, that could be achieved through different ways. Like the mayor just highlighted it's, we're kind of expensive to get a booth. So maybe some of the ways we do that is allow for some spots to be offered to local vendors there in the city that you don't so normally we, get. So we would play really favorites? <laughs> no, we would guess, hey, you've got an odd sounding last name, so you get to be in a booth for free. Um, 
That's not how it got the point of it. Yeah, I wouldn't think you'd want that. I well, no, we're not talking about that's not what that is, though. That's not how you define culture. Culture is arts, music, writing. It's what makes you, it's, it's part of your identity. It goes beyond how your name sounds. My name sounds funny. So what? What's your point? My point is that government should never play favorites. When that plane government came. should be open to everyone all the time based on their work, attitude, and effort. And no one should be excluded. And governments in the past excluded people that they didn't like. The reason why DEI exists is because whole groups of people have been systematically excluded. That's just, that's exactly what I just said, right? Therefore, it will take folks like you and I to change that course. And how do we change it? By making, By making it sure that our strategic plan is to everybody and not playing favorites. This isn't playing favorites. It's I would encourage you to take some well, training. Thank, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I could teach so you. So kind of you. Okay. Yes. Let's loop back around to the performance measure that we have up here. I've heard two recommendations. One, that we broaden a little bit to strive to have all community events include some culturally diverse performances and our vendors, or we can tweak this metric. I think if you have strive in there, that perhaps it doesn't have a measure now, but that does allow for staff to perhaps develop some policies or programs underneath that they can bring back to council. It's, it's, oh, 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 it's okay. If you want to go first. I, I was just going to say it's, it's strive to me means like there's, there's intention with, as you look and plan for these events, you're putting some intention into how you're, you know, who you're adding. I would be open to splitting it to, to two, honestly, because if you want to put strive to, allow all cultures. I'm fine with that. I just don't think there's a lot of teeth. I think that's just how we should operate. And we're always trying to be inclusive of everybody, no matter who they are. Um, but I do like the fact that the city has traditionally tried to do some cultural events. Um, I like the multicultural because you're not picking one over the other. You're saying we want to celebrate everybody's culture, but I do like those cultural events. Latino Fest was, was a fun event. I enjoyed it every time we put it on. So to me, it's almost two different things because mm -hmm. the way these metrics are. So um, if everybody else would be open, I almost feel like they should be two different things. I think that will give us a broader perspective. And, uh, and I think our, our community would benefit from that too. And then that would keep us from excluding, you know, any of the specialty events too. Yeah. So I agree with that. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> I will revise that one. So we have an and or. Hi. You, that's that's clear. Yep. 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 Got it. We've got it. Next one. All right. Develop a more proactive two-way communication and cross-departmental approaches to work with neighborhoods throughout the city, including including those with and without formal homeowners associations. Measures to develop collaborative outreach programs with 25% of Westminster's 160 HOAs and apartment communities by September 30th of 2023. I, I like this. I just would like to know how we also reach out to the ones without, just because I'm from mm -hmm. the neighborhood that is, you know, traditionally one of the biggest neighborhoods that also has biggest section of it doesn't have an HOA. I mean, we have community groups that are um, open to meet with the city. So I just don't want them to be excluded because they don't have an HOA. I totally agree. Yeah, the city's not represented by HOA. I mean, yours, Sheridan Green, you don't have one either, right? Yeah, there's a ton of communities that don't have one. Historic Westminster doesn't have one. Okay, we will work up a second uh, measure there for the non-HOA ones. We put, we'll consult with our staff uh, who work yeah, in our communities. Is, we'll, we'll this come. is only with uh, HOAs and apartments. Yeah. But you could do the same thing and just make sure you advertise that they were going to have a meeting at the Grange. That's, you know, for your community or countryside rec. Or mm -hmm. just don't want them to be left out. I'll split that and do another one that's specific to 
neighborhoods that don't have a formal organization. Well, they do. Yeah, I guess they, some, they do in do. a way, you know, yeah. like they, they're do. community groups. So I don't know. It's like helping it formalize them too. Facebook page count. <laughs> Kind of, well, it's a active, form of outreach. And they hold events, right? right? It's a form of outreach and it's identif readily identifiable group. When we had this before, um, ours, we met at Sheridan Green. Yeah. All right. Moving on to the next one to develop a structured program and awareness campaign to encourage residents to shop at locally owned small businesses in the community. Got a couple of different metrics for this one. The first is that 100% of participating businesses in a shop local program. Second, 75% of local small businesses satisfied with or very satisfied with the program. And the third is that there's a 10% increase year over year in participating businesses. I feel like. Yes, thank you. That percentage should not be there. It should be 100. So whether we want this oh. program managed by the Chamber of Commerce, are we recreating the wheel here? I mean, they do a lot of this. I think, yeah, I think that's already in our uh, agreement, in our uh, memorandum of understanding that we um but we don't manage them, so it needs to be under one of our departments. And I mean that this, like in this metric, if they participated in the shop local chamber thing, that would be the metric we'd want, right? So if 80% of them participate in the chamber thing out of our businesses, that would mean the metrics met. So we're just encouraging them to participate. Is that accurate? Yes. So even our support of the chamber is really part of this. Yeah, this because if you, if you scrolled over to your broad your council objective, it's fostering a well-informed citizenry. And part of that is outreach, education, and opportunities. So part of it is just making sure that there's the awareness out there and working with the chamber to make sure your small businesses are aware of this program and these opportunities. And the chamber itself. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And the objective, the focus objective, it says develop structure program can we say something like cold develop with chamber or something to be specific or leverage the chamber or work with the chamber yeah rather than it sounds like we're recreating it from scratch when it exists something chamber something chamber something chamber well or could we add a uh, a, a performance measure related to uh, the chamber perhaps rather than alter the um alter the objective Perhaps we could offer up a KPI where we measure our our co-success with the chamber. Perhaps yeah, the chamber has a as a subset of our population represented, but not all of it. So these are um, these are KPIs for the whole city. Yeah, um, so maybe we could introduce a KPI as to how we're doing with the chamber. If that would be how would that be measured? I'm just curious. I mean, we 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 know we can we know what the, what the chamber membership is. So. Maybe with working with economic development, we could come up with something there. Is that that's good for me? Max focus objective, continue to implement the ADA transition plan. This one we have tied to a community survey question, accessibility of streets, sidewalks, and buildings for people with disabilities. And this would be a new one uh, that's in the 2022 survey. So you're hoping to get an average rating of 75 or above. But if that survey comes in and it's less than, then clearly your first performance measure would be to increase that to 75. Next one. Continue to draw from community diversity and planning and preparing for a program throughout the city. This one is also tied to that community survey. 
Uh, the city provides an opportunity for all voices to be heard and draws upon community diversity and decision making. And this would be to increase to top 12 in the front range, which these are a little bit, these metrics are a little bit, um, to reach those are 20%. Increase, you already have an average rating of 75. So you could also say that you would like that rating to increase to 80 or 85. Oh, no. <laughs> That's, That's, not helpful. Oh, That's Adele, ready. yeah, about half a second. Not now, Every not now. <laughs> Prices are hurt. Prices are hurt. It is. We all we all agreed. <laughs> all right. So, how do we feel about the metric for this one? Next. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Another question on: Do we need a? another focused objective in this objective for sort of economic de development objective re related to restaurants, diversity of a restaurant. I know it's sort of market driven, but we could also be seeking more cultural diversity across our restaurants. I, you certainly could add a focused objective, but I feel like there is quite a list of focused objectives now. And I think that rather than continuing to add objectives, um, then energy and attention gets split all over the place. It's something that just like that affordable housing, I would recommend that you start with this pretty solid set. And then as things get achieved or accomplished and you make some progress, as you do your annual review of this plan, you have the ability to add in some more focused objectives. I think there are 36, maybe 37 focused objectives at this point, which is a lot. So I, I'm just concerned that council, the community staff are going to start losing sight. But that assumes that we have the right, all the right focused objectives in here already. So why add more, right? I don't know if we do. I don't see a total number as being a hindrance. I think we should just do what we think the city needs. And if there's a lot, probably the city needs a lot of things. And I think that we can all agree that there's a lot of change neither. Certainly, but part of the strategic plan is being very intentional about figuring out and prioritizing what you need to address first. And I think as a group, you've kind of decided that these are the set of objectives you'd like to start with and like staff to prioritize with the community and businesses. And then as those things get accomplished or progress gets made. But I'm speaking to a focused objective, not a strategic objective. I think we should add another focused one. I'm going to disagree on, on this, this pretense and this is the same as the climate change thing. That's how we should go about our business. I feel like the, the opportunities, we're always trying to find the things that are uh, more energy efficient or whatever. When it comes to climate, we're trying to find what things that are more diverse all the time as far as like being inclusive, but you don't want to pass by opportunities of businesses that are being market driven just because we're, we're busy looking for a particular kind of business. I'll give you an example. For many years, the council had an uh, a objective of more chef owned restaurants and that was the objective it wasn't more restaurants it was more chef owned restaurants i don't know how many chef owned restaurants we ended up having but it certainly was an objective for a long time so i feel like just saying hey we want you know economic development knows we want more diverse offerings if the opportunity arises that they're going to jump on them if, if it arises um but the focus is you know more more restaurants if you know if they come forward we want a vibrant economy so if the opportunities come forward we want to make sure that we're fostering whatever opportunity makes westminster more of a vibrant community with more diverse jobs and you know a pumping economy it's my two cents anyone else cool. 
four. All right, priority four. We have consolidated a couple of these focus objectives because really in talking with staff, particularly PRL, a lot of these things were all, if you're going to be doing one of them, you're naturally going to be doing these others. So we consolidated the focus objectives so that it gives you easier performance outcome measures. The first one to develop and communicate to the community a plan for the acquisition of an additional open space and trails. We have that the plan is completed by December of 2023. And that was one that we talked about a little bit the last work session. We don't necessarily want to give away all the strategy behind what the city may be thinking about. Just to have the plan. Next one. Next. Next. Is to update in partnership with the community, the PRL Comp Master Plan to address libraries, parks, golf, open space, trails, urban tree canopy, recreation programs, and recreation facilities. And then we specifically called out all of the different plan components that used to be individual objectives, so that you still have them all stated in there. It's just encompassed in one objective. And then the performance measures on the right. All residents live within a quarter mile of a park, open space, or trail access point by December 24. To develop management and acquisition plans that evaluate the current and future needs and opportunities of the city's public lands, programs, and urban tree canopy by December of 24. Um, pause there, see if there are questions on those two. Yeah. Um. Unless we imagine we are all already meeting a quarter mile of a park, open space, or trail access point by December 24. I mean, was that like one more acquisition and then we're there? I mean, that's, it's, I don't know if it's like the best measure to be planning a city by. Um, I don't mind identifying a goal where we want to have residents within a quarter mile of some type of specific amenity space or an acre per thousand or acres per thousand residents um, measure. Um, this is just like, oh, by, you know, access to a trail point, I would say that's not the same thing to me as a park. And so I just, I'm not seeing where, we're not really defining, uh, you know, like in equal access to park uh, amenities and recreational amenities for the city through this measure. A park is different than an open space, it's different than a trailhead. Agreed. I think this really speaks to having residents have the ability to access just some type of open space trail or something. Um, it speaks that it's not all urban area. And that's a measure that we see in a lot of communities that they either try and measure it by a quarter mile or by a third of a mile. It's typically to a park or some type of defined amenity. I, there's just that I think like a park is so different than a trail point. Um, and it would be good to know where we're starting. Isn't it? Yeah, what's the baseline? Mm -hmm. what, where? So how many of people aren't within this measure? Mm -hmm. We, we can take uh, this one away and work on it a bit. Uh, there's one possibility of splitting this performance measure into two and maybe having this as a as the broader one. So there is some access to something uh, within, a, within a radius and then um, in a different one for park and open space, perhaps. Uh, I don't think Tomas uh, <laughs> is here. Maybe you could. I stopped this. <laughs> so uh, there was a lot of, uh, you'll remember in the last few years, there's been a lot conversation about providing access of a quarter mile to parks. You're absolutely right. And as I was thinking about it, the number one use of parks is uh, passive use of parks through walking and jogging and just being in nature. And so I take full responsibility for this quarter mile access to trails, trails and open space, because in my mind, it was creating that 10 minute walk to an opportunity to be in nature, whether it's a park or it's uh, a, just an open space. So that's where that came from. And a lot of communities, you're right, many communities are using this as a measure of accessibility to open to nature. 
And that's when you do any, if you ask anybody what's their number one goal for themselves for a park, they want access to nature. They're all gonna put that as number one. And then walking and jogging and just being, having a place to be out in nature will be number two. Uh, organized sports and all of that, while it's great to offer it and we wanna keep offering it, it's always much, much, much lower on the list of what people are looking for. So if we wanna create a measure, and I also think that we are, we don't, uh, I don't think it's reasonable. I agree with you, Councillor, to say we can achieve this by December of 2024, but I think we should have a plan that identifies it. And to Councillor Baker's point is that we need to do the analysis to understand what do we have right now? What's our baseline? And then how do we get, how do we achieve this access for everybody, equal access to nature, uh, which I believe is one of your main goals Okay, so I get that. Um, and I like the idea that it's not the idea that we're going to meet that goal by yeah, 24. No, I think I misread um, that. Okay, because I mean, I've been doing this for over 20 years too, in terms of like comprehensive yeah. plan and yeah. how you're, you're planning your communities out. And um, can we also make sure that, I mean, a quarter mile is supposed to be a five minute walk. Are we identifying, we should be using walk sheds versus just quarter mile radius is just kind of amp it up a bit. Yeah, the um, walk shed's much more accurate. Um, I usually strive for a 10 minute, 10 minute walk. I thought for me, and well, maybe it's the way I walk it, I can do a quarter mile 10 minutes. <laughs> That's what normal people are working at, sort of a normal amble would take to get there. Yeah. Uh, but we can definitely, I, I agree with you that it needs a little bit of refinement. So. Okay, thank you. What else? Next one. All right. Develop management and acquisition plans that evaluate the current and future needs and opportunities of the city's public lands programs and urban tree canopy by December 2024. We'll speak to Tomas's point. He's wanting to make sure that those plans are developed and you can establish those baselines for measuring moving forward. Relatedly, to complete a, complete a city trail plan that includes inventory and maps, the existing city trail network, addressing gaps in access and establishes the criteria for trail management consistent with the purpose the trail serves, including but not limited to surface type, maintenance routines, and allowed use evaluation by June 30 of 2024. I have two questions on this one. Um, we don't have one today, a city trail plan. Just curious. We have a map, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we say complete a city trail plan, are we talking about updating what we currently have? Not getting any? Okay. And the second question, how closely would this work together with the fire mitigation plan? I assume when we talk about maintenance and so forth, that fire mitigation plan and this needs to work pretty closely together, right? Yes, Councillor, that's exactly right, because a lot of the trails form are an important part of the fire um, stops that are included, so, and as well as some of the mowing that we do is intended to help uh, mitigate the fire risk of fire. It would be very much hand in hand. And it doesn't have to be in this, but just I know in the back of your head, and I've mentioned it before because I've heard of that at COD especially, um, where the council and managers go and talk about, they, they have a master plan that they're looking at for the entire region for those trails. And so where our trails then go into Broomfield, North Glen, Denver, Federal Heights, um, talking with those partners, how things are gonna connect if they aren't already connected so that people can, Keep on going. And there's already a group working on that. Just so we're a part of it. Next one. All right. So the next one, enhance the city's use of existing public lands through collaboration with the community and neighboring jurisdictions to create placemaking and positive activation that provides a sense of safety and belonging to all residents. This measurement would be a 5% increase in resident satisfaction with community spaces specifically. 
Is that time bound to 22? I think it should be. Uh, actually, it would have to. It would have to be then tied to our next biannual survey. So that would be 24. 24. We'll get we'll get we'll get a little we'll get a baseline. Well, we'll get a baseline this year on this biannual survey, and that next. Yeah. So it had 24. Yeah. Can you put that in there? Which will also tie directly, I think, into our homeless effort. Right. We're performing periodic review of feed and fine structures. This is one outstanding that staff and I are working to develop a good performance metric around whether it is they're evaluating and reviewing a particular amount of finer fees a year, how they're going to really measure that. If it's a compliance or restructure something like that. Next, allocate funding within the general fund budget for the payment of residential dog license fees. And this is a straightforward implemented by a particular date. Has it been done? Yes or no? Next, continue utility bill assistance programs to help residents who may struggle to pay their bills. And this performance metric is simply to maintain current utility bill assistance programs. There was some conversation at the last work session around this utility bill assistance program. So maintaining thoughts or questions there. Why wouldn't we want to expand it? What was the reason? I'd like to decrease it by making water affordable enough that people don't have that in the system. I think it'd be a reasonable budget discussion. One way or the other. Maybe we add into this performance metric sure. that it's something that gets discussed during budget development. Can we see some sort of... Uh, Obviously, you're going to have to come back with this, but I'd like to see um, usage, say, over the last five-year period, what it's done as far as percent of people using it. Has it increased, decreased? Well, hit more, more over summer, right? Yeah, I'd like to see what, you know, what kind of metrics. I don't know that we have. I don't remember seeing what, you know, what it's done year over year. I think I asked for that. Somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of them that you had sent me. That was one of my questions a few months ago. Yeah, we should be able to pull that up. Yeah, what? Well, yeah, I, I remember seeing a graph, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So next, continue to partner with the school districts, parks, arts, and library to find natural synergy and compatible goals. Just to demonstrate collaborative efforts with the North Metro Arts Alliance, Westminster Historical Society, Medusa Collective, and other arts and culture organizations for 10 events annually. How many events are we committing ourselves to? Or are these overlapping? Some of, I, some of them likely overlap, yes. Well, some of the, like the activity guide that just came out, you know, the highlighting the ones that our partners do, you know, so um, it was a big highlights uh, historic Westminster included in there. The historical society events are now included in there. So the city doesn't have to do, you know, it's highlighting them and, and staff time as far as promoting them. But oh, like we're not running them all. Right. Yeah. But that's where that collaborative part really jumps in. Yeah. Good collaboration. Next is to elevate the profile of Westminster's arts, culture, and history. A measure 2019 Arts and Culture Master Plan updated to align the city's 2022 strategic plan by November 30th of this year. <coughs> about increasing offerings or 
activities or measuring events slash activities. Just we don't, you know, we have some, but are we trying is that a baseline? And then are we trying to if we're trying to elevate the profile, are we trying to add to it or just get those to have more attendance? We'll add in here to establish a baseline and we can, when we're doing implementation planning for these objectives and performance measures, we can really specify and get granular on that one. Yeah, like how many residents participate in, um, I mean, maybe over time, that's something we could collect through our survey. Like, do you participate in arts events? I know North Metro Arts Historical Society, anybody that goes for SCFD money has these numbers. Very good numbers because that's the only way you get your money. That's a good one. And that's the way you're our tier one, tier two, or three, tier three. We do all the work on that. Right, the city doesn't probably have that. Okay. Next is to integrate and expand access to arts and culture throughout the city. Measures to provide at least 30 mobile art or cultural programs annually, touching all regions of the city. Next. Attract and support artists, art groups, makers, and creative industries. A measure to include input from at least 20 local and regional artists, art groups, makers, and creative industries in the 2022 update to that arts and culture master plan. Can we add tattoo artists in there? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> local artists. It's, right. hand. But it's always conceptual. <laughs> Is this could be a right? When we're talking about like digital collaboration, a stakeholder <laughs> group we're trying to create, a steering committee, advisory committee for this plan process. I mean, include input could be like <clears throat> a little vague. You can define that a little bit more. I will say any any master plan that's developed comes before council for approval and is a public record for people to come. So that's also an area where they can get in as far as yeah, but if we wanted to help shape what's happening, just some clarity on you know how involved we want people if we're just collecting. Discrete input. Okay. All right. Ensure the sustainability of arts and culture in Westminster. The measure for this is a percent for our program is drafted and proposed by October of 2023. What's that? We have to draft it. No, um, what's percent for our program? Think of the percentage of total development cost. Like Denver has one percent. Oh, requirement. And I don't mean to be rude, but when did we talk about this? This is a yeah. This was staff added objective. So. Our Council current. never talked about a percent for our program, but staff thought this would be a good defining way to meet the goal to ensure sustainability of the arts. There, there is a small uh, amount collected uh, during the development process. It's very, very small, yeah. um, and it's. I think it's a it's a fixed dollar amount. Two thousand dollars per acre. Yeah. So with the the. Um, and be to increase that or just figure out how to actually utilize what we're already taking? Increase. It's $2,000 <laughs> per acre. It's very well, the first, small. Hear me out. If we're, not, if we're not utilizing it now and you can't show me value that we've done over the past, I'm going to be hard pressed to say this is a good spend of 
taxpayer money. I'm all for increasing the arts, but I'm not for government taking more money that they haven't efficiently spent on what they were supposed to spend it on. Or is there in just making a basis for how it could be spent, right? If it's in an arts and culture master plan and there's a clear path for how it could be spent because it is so small right now, it's usually just um, spent on a sculpture that stays on the site. And so there could be broader opportunities for us to you know, utilize those funds in a way where it's more meaningful. But right now it's a small amount that may not lead to and is it paid by the development community? Okay, thank you. That's how you have the dolphins on the corner of 92nd and Sheridan. I like it better when there was water in there and people put bubble Because some of them mother <laughs> love dolphins. That's the reason those are there. Then we have the gold horse down Walmart. So isn't this program then going to end when we build out the city and we're all but there? It's getting small. Yeah. That's for your adaptive use <laughs> and redevelopment comes in. <laughs> that, but then you would, you know, then you don't get much, right? Because they're just, it's everything's just redeveloping on a smaller scale. You don't have, you know, because it's and it's only on commercial uh, development as well. So it's a very, it's pretty limited. What we get it, what we get it from. All right. Next one, to promote the authentic history and cultural assets of Westminster, the economic driver, through support of the Arts District and Historic Westminster, by leveraging partnerships with organizations like the Historic Landmark Board, measure to formalize a 501c3 and increase funding capacity, have that established by October of 2023. And who's forming the 501c3? And who's going to run it and spend the money? Because this historic society is already a 501c3. That's in the Metro Article. Are you guys a 501c3 already? Sure. Yeah. So I want to know who's the next party that's trying to be a 501c3. I don't know how many we're going to have or need or what? This is so this is an arts district in historic Westminster. So oh okay, so we have North. All right. Yeah, it's um that's missing in action. We'll we will we will mm -hmm. clean that up. There's just no there's no um, verb there. It's like form or yeah. encourage or Nothing support is or yeah. Yep. Okay. In, enhance current. Right. And I want to know who's forming it and why. Yeah. Because you have too many down there, you eat each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. It says it wants to be a, well an economic driver. So what's it going to do to do that? Exactly. The historical society in North Metro would like to know who, whose competition is coming from <laughs> and why. All right. On to the last priority. Ensure that the comprehensive plan and affordable and workforce housing strategic plan are reflective of and responsive to the future needs of our community. And measure the comprehensive plan and affordable and workforce housing strategic plan updates are completed by the end of September 30th of this year. So that assumes that we have an affordable and workforce housing strategic plan. We do. We do? Yeah. It was done in 2017, I believe. Did we update it as part of the new comp plan process? Did we update the um, our housing needs assessment? No. So how would we update our strategy if we don't have updated members? Oh. That would be part of our work plan is we would have to regather some data, I think. I think a couple of And next is to identify and carry out water treatment plant studies and improvements that integrate current improvement needs with upcoming regulatory requirements and the city's long-term goals. 
this one, we've got percent of project completed, percent of selection study completed, and I believe. Go ahead. Um, I want to go back to this last one just mm -hmm. because this is um, that focus objective needs to be driven by availability of water. Because none of that happens unless you have water to do it. I know I've heard multiple people on this council say so, so it absolutely needs to be part of that focused objective. Do you want to say like in response to the future needs and resources of our community? Wordsmith it however you want as long as it, it, it equals there ain't water, there ain't building. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have questions on water treatment plant studies? See me. Okay. Work to improve the pavement quality index of roads throughout the city. Improve the PQI to 63 by 2027. Currently at 53. Pick that number as a group, or did you guys drive that number? Staff drove it. Is there any reasoning behind it? That's been through it. Yeah, isn't that a restored? Yeah. Isn't yeah. that restoring it to a certain level? I was trying to find that. We can, I was trying to find we can and ought to clarify where that 63 came from. I think it, it, I think it is set to a historic level. Fair enough. Because we did have some specific dollar discussion too. So mm -hmm. next. All right. Pursue opportunities to increase funding for streets maintenance, including alternative revenue streams and the city's infrastructure roadway improvement fee. Measure is grant and or alternative funding obtained as a total percentage of the cost of street maintenance. To reread that. What's an example of alternative funding? If I may, um, some is uh, commercial mileage use calculations. Okay. So, just my, my only thing on this is that if we're saying we want in the one above it that we want to get up to 63 PQI. Um, I'm all for us finding alternatives, but this is the same kind of thing. I don't want us just not getting to that 63 because we're busy chasing alternative dollars opposed to um, prioritizing our current funding. So um, it doesn't mean that if you get the funding that, you know, I'm not open to us swapping it in and reprioritizing. Or, or, or adding, adding or to it. it. Yeah. We're getting to 73%. <laughs> Whatever, if it's not percent, 73 PQI, but. I think this may be a case of us um, adding a second KPI in here to deal with the total level of funding. Mm -hmm. And then a second one, which is closer to this one, which which I think also needs a little bit more work, which is to talk about how much grant funding we can get and apply. Um, so let us work with those two. This has been very helpful. Um, so we'll add a second KPI up for overall funding level. Um, and then um, separate out this one and be more specific about what we mean by grant and alternative funding. Okay. Develop recommendations and an associated action plan for addressing deferred maintenance throughout the city. The measures to develop an action plan to address deferred maintenance by March of 2023 to allow for budgetary planning for the 24 budget cycle. Isn't this just a, a how of the first one? So getting to a PQI of 63, aren't these just ways of doing that? This one is certainly one of the ways of doing that. 
but when we talked uh, with staff and worked through this, when one of the things that they felt they really needed to do, and it's enough work that I think it warrants being a measure, is get their arms around all of that deferred maintenance. And are we talking about citywide? What are we talking about in terms of infrastructure for water, for roads, for public works, equipment, and really formalizing a plan around all of that? That was a question that came up with staff. Like when we say deferred maintenance, are we talking about citywide? Are we talking about just public works? That's going to take some time and work to really quantify what that is and then develop a good plan for how you start addressing it. Yeah, I suggest in this case that we need to add after deferred maintenance uh, a, a bit of a description of what we're talking about there because it's broader than streets. Um, it applies to other infrastructure as well. So um, I think that's where the confusion is. This looks like a streets point, but it's actually... No, it's not just streets. It's not just streets. Okay. That means. I apologize for that. We'll clarify. Unless council disagrees, but I think that that that, that captures what council discussed when they when you talked about this one. It was all city infrastructure. Yeah, because that fills in after the the comma on the broad one, comma maintenance and equipment needs. Complete and implement the Federal Boulevard and 72nd Avenue corridor studies. Percent of studies completed and percent implemented. This one, they didn't take those measures further because really there are some external factors that are beyond Westminster's control. So they wanted to recognize those. And once they get those studies completed and implemented, they can figure out how to describe funding and those partnerships. Increase pedestrian connectivity and safety throughout the city. Increased connectivity of trails, sidewalk, and walkways in linear feet completed by 15% in 2023. But again, without a baseline, that's meaningless. That seems like a lie. No? Uh, yeah, it does. That was my only when I read that earlier. I was like, also, it has the word safety in there. Uh, are we saying that more connected trails would increase safety? Or are we missing a measure for safety? We're missing sidewalk. Well, yeah, the sidewalk is because I think that was really a big part of what we've got where we don't have safe sidewalk, safe passage. And, May not have some street. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Pedestrian connecting and safety throughout the city. Increased connectivity trails, sidewalks, and walkways. Yeah. That's a principle. I know it's kind of, it's kind of broad. <laughs> okay. we'll, we'll see how it flushes out. All right, the last one. Continue and expand water conservation programs and projects. Measurement is a percent decrease in water usage per capita. You know, this is what I'm saying was the city's plan with its conservation plan was to take water from existing users and give to new users. This, per, this percent decrease in water usage per capita, who are we going to give that water to? Who are we saving the water for? I, I don't have a problem with an overall strategy of educating people on how they can best use their water, because there may be times when that would come in handy. Right. I, well, and I think we addressed that in the first part too, is so that we can water conservation methods to prevent um, exploitation destruction and neglect right so then we can maybe key this in no no one wants to waste water right water usage we want to use it as it's appropriate and the biggest user of water in the city is the city with our parks what do we use a sixth of all the water in the city two thoughts 
I'm not sure what the number is, but it's it is a very high percentage. Besides education to residents, how they can consider, would it be more meaningful for us as a city to be the leader in that and say we're going to, as a city, decrease X percent, being the ones who go first? But the other half of that, that's always been a concern of mine, is as soon as you do that, that's realistically revenue out of the utility fund. And so it's always a double-edged sword because we're trying to fund things. And if you decrease use, then that's correct. So it's, not fine line. So yeah. I, I think we need to be very mindful of that balancing act because then you arbitrarily make yourself maybe potentially have to jack up rates more than you would otherwise. So may I? Uh, so are we looking to, uh, would we potentially be looking to have a KPI here, which is talking about the city use of water? And I think the city, city use of water would be excellent. Yeah. I, think would it would be a, I think it would be a meaningful Great thing example. to say we go, we're going to go first and say, <clears throat> here's how you can do it. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to put our money where our mouth is and show you that we did it. Oh, what a what that, but I would want to know what that means. Like, if it you, means does that like mean? our local park didn't get watered, say it was three times a week, it got watered twice a week last year. So they told us it's going to not look brilliant green, it's going to look a little different with a little brown in it. Well, and also, well, the city's done programs like we've changed some really park space into open space mm -hmm. and reduced that. Wonderful that. But the other part of it is who are we saving it for? Our future. Well, we, we can only bank with a semi or a desert. Yeah, but we only can bank so much per year. But I'm saying we will have years where we have less. And so, under Colorado and law, less and less and less. Under Colorado we law, we have to use all the water we own beneficially. We cannot save water. If we don't use all the water we own beneficially, we lose it. We will lose the water rights. We're obligated to use it. And that's everyone's, on, I think we've actually um, heard from our water council that storage is beneficial use for a municipality. Okay. Confirm that, but I don't know that um, exhausting storage is required. I think storage satisfies beneficial storage use. Storage using, okay, absolutely. But we have finite, Storage too. That's too why we, you know, adding water yeah, facility. Well, that's why the Wattenberg. Yeah. Um, and I would just say, under the conservation programs, because you've heard me say before, we have the the plant thing. Is they have one to three plants that are native to the arid. Let's go with the local people that have um, and, and talk with them, and plan ahead and have them bring in the things that grow here so that we can advertise and support our local businesses. And they can have 100% of their plants that are semi-arid um, that will grow here. Do we have a metric, Jody, around um, the areas that we have changed to natural grass? One like that sticks out in my mind is um, part of, I don't know if they still call it Toad Bowl Park, but that's what I always called it off, of, off the countryside. Next to camper. They did look awful for the first couple of years. They changed that part, but now you can't really tell the it's difference. Um, but I'm curious, like what, what was the actual impact to you know, how much water we did, didn't use? So that, you know, those are the kind of metrics that I think are meaningful. Like, you know, how did we decrease it? Did we do it by switching to natural grass? Did we switch it by changing our watering habits, changing uh, irrigation systems. Even tell people what the other kind of grasses they can see instead of Kentucky bluegrass. Yep. And, and I believe council has funded um, upgrades to irrigation, irrigation systems, which might have a more efficient use of the water mm -hmm. in the parks and golf courses as a result. Well, there's 18 new trees in my park, so it's going to take more water. <laughs> <laughs> it's good for the canopy. It takes water. It's, it, they don't they don't grow by breath. Okay, so what do you want us to do with 12 through 14? 
12 through 14, you do not have to look at. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I still think those are things that staff will go through and tie to your guiding principles during their implementation work for the strategic plan. So the only question I have for you now is with those objectives that we just went through, are you happy with them as they are to finalize those? Staff heard the concerns we had, so as because I know they're going to work on these, they aren't real happy with absolutely everything. They're going to tweak, so they heard us. I trust. Okay. Okay. And we else? will take that feedback and finalize performance metrics when we do that implementation plan, which really is how staff will then, after council has adopted the plan, how staff plans to roll it out. We will finalize those performance measures. And objectives are good to go now. So what we can do, and maybe we'll just check this out process, stay with the current timing, bring the objectives back for council, city council to approve in public meeting. And perhaps that night or very shortly thereafter, bring back in a, uh, a near final version of the key performance indicators. So we can continue this, um, this sequential approach to keep making progress. And we'll and we'll save the, the KPI finalizing for the, the next step if that makes sense. We'll give you another chance. To, I'm sorry, Councillor, give you another chance to look at this wording. Um, but it can be the key performance indicators um, based on tonight's discussion. We've got a lot of great input from you all. So thank you very much for that. A lot of very, very good direction. Can I give a clarification? Yes. My timeline? yes. Uh, so I believe the plan would be council subway will bring back the strategic plan, the goals, the uh, strategic objectives and the focus objectives, objectives on hopefully for next week's packet, so right. for council's adoption, and then gives a couple more weeks to, to clean up the KPIs, and it may be later in May that we bring that back to you. Thank you for that time. That we appreciate that. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. So in that in that approach, we'll strip away the draft KPIs from what you would see, knowing that we're working on it and bringing them back in based on this discussion tonight, if that's okay. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank you.